Hello, everyone. Welcome to Raising Hope, Canada in the World After COVID-19, the first in a series of webinars brought to you by the Kuchiching Conference. Lake Kuchiching is located in the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg. The Anishinaabeg include the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi First Nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. Please acknowledge the traditional lands where you are now located. My name is Doug West, conference co-organizer, along with my good friend, Wendy Feldman, who you'll hear from in a moment. It is our distinct pleasure to offer this Zoom gathering as a renewal of the spirit of the Kuchiching Conference experience, which remains a civil place to disagree. As always, there are a few housekeeping rules all of your cameras have been turned off so that we can focus on the speakers and their ideas. Your sound is also turned off so that you and the ambient noise of your life are discouraged from interrupting the proceedings. They will be turned on during breaks and at the end of the conference when we invite all of you to share memories and friendships made at Lake Kutiching over the years. The chat function will remain open throughout the conference, but we ask that if you have questions to pose, and I'm gonna say this twice, if you have a question to pose to the speakers, please use the Q&A function. It's a tab at the bottom of the taskbar on the bottom of your page. It says Q&A, you can't miss it. Well, maybe you can, anyway. I hope you don't miss it. I will be monitoring the Q&A throughout the conference and will relay your questions to the moderator and speakers. There are three sections in today's meeting. Each will be followed by a timed 10 minute break. And at the end of the conference, we will hear from Madeline Koch and John Curtin for a brief message about the future of the Kuchiching Conference, followed by an open session, as I mentioned, to meet and greet each other just like we used to do at the lake. Here, as promised, is Wendy Feldman, conference coordinator and co organizer and longtime conference attendee and supporter to introduce our first section. Wendy, over to you. Thanks, Doug. At Kuchiching, at Lake Kuchiching, every summer for 85 years, about 200 people came together. Today, we're at home but connected online across Canada, around the world. And I have to say today, we welcome more than 600 participants to our first online conference, Raising Hope, Canada and the World After COVID. We're pleased to be joined today by the Honorable Elizabeth Dadswell, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. Welcome, Your Honor. Doug, it's been terrific working with you together as co-chairs and thank you for all your excellent ideas and hard work over these last months. And a word to recognize as well our volunteer organizing committee, Tom Zog, Howard Knopf, Catherine Bovey, Madeline Koch, John Curtin, and of course, thanks to Daniel Lees from the CIC. Ben Rosewell, president of the Canadian uh, International Council has supported and encouraged us to bring lively debate and public affairs back to the lake, even online. And today it's our honor to uh, uh, start our event with the Honorable Bill Graham, who is the chair of the CIC to introduce our opening session. Bill. It says, am I unmuted? The host has disabled me. You're good. Are we on? Yes. Okay. Well, I, I, Wendy, I just follow up your, your words, you know, uh, as the chair of the CIC, I'm, I'm happy to work with Ben Rosewell. We're, we're so pleased the whole of the CIC organization to be associated with Kuchiching. Myself as a former participant, many of those wonderful events at the lake. I congratulate everybody in the Kuchiching organization for getting, bringing, keeping this wonderful organization alive. And I know we'll have many in, more inspirational moments with this organization as we go ahead. So it's my great pleasure today uh, 
uh, as to introduce uh, my friend and my former leader, uh, our former prime minister who served as prime minister of Canada for our 21st prime minister from 2003 to 2006, the right honorable Paul Martin. Uh, Mr. Martin uh, was also, you will recall, a remarkable minister of finance who really rescued Canada during those dark days of the 90s when we were struggling with another crisis at that time. For a long time, in, he represented in Parliament from 88 to 2008, he represented the riding of La Salle et Mar in Montreal as the Liberal Member of Parliament. Since leaving public life, Paul, if I may call him that, Prime Minister Yus has been really extraordinarily involved in two major issues. Development issues where he's advised uh, African development on African development. And as a personal story, I just want to share this with our audience. I was in Washington with Paul some years ago together and we were at an important conference and he spoke on development issues. And somebody said to me, somebody at the Woodrow Wilson Foundation said, he had never heard a leader of government have such a mastery and understanding of development issues. And he's continued to use that experience today. And as well, he's continued to use his inspirational leadership and commitment to the education, health, and well being of our Indigenous population in Canada, to which he's devoted extraordinary time, energy, and effort. And we're all grateful to him for that. His book, Hell or High Water My Life in and Out of Politics, was published in 2008. Uh, he is an, a companion of the Order of Canada. Uh, he's been recognized with many honors, most recently, an honorary doctorate uh, at Brock University. And I'm just very pleased to be able to introduce my former leader and my friend, Right Honorable Paul Martin. And he'll be joined by our moderator, Carol Off, uh, a voice we all know from CBC's radio, As It Happens. 6.30, we turn it on to get both informed, entertained by somebody who has an extraordinary way of being able to bring together such important information for all of us. Her career as a TV and radio journalist has covered many stories around the world, garnering, and she's garnered many honors and awards for her distinguished reporting. She's an award-winning documentation and author. I won't cite the names of her books. She's written many of them. You're gonna see some of them on the shelf behind her when she speaks to us. So welcome both the Right Honorable Paul Martin and welcome to Carol Off. Have I unmuted? Yes, you have. Mr. Martin, I think you're on now. I think that you, you can now begin your presentation. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Carol. Well, thank you very much for, for, chairing, for chairing this, Carol. And, and may I just say to Bill, Bill and I go back a long way. We were friends from a long way. Um, he was an outstanding uh, uh, member of our law class, the outstanding member. Uh, as a minister, both in his involvement in foreign affairs, defense, his huge knowledge. And I, I've got to say that, that I've admired Bill and we're close friends. But I've got to say that having him introduce me and have to say nice things about me, my God, that gave me a kick. So there you go. Um, and, and thank you, Carol, for this. And I will begin. I was asked... Uh, to make brief remarks uh, to open today's discussion. And I do so um, while the world faces, faces two overwhelming issues, climate change and COVID-19, which we have to deal with. Now, most of us in our lifetimes, and Bill could certainly go back and this, have spent our lifetimes watching as a never ending list of schisms between countries that dominated the global stage. Not since the world wars have we faced such massive forces attacking us collectively as we do now. That being said, what is, what is happening now, and what's happening today in terms of COVID, in terms of uh, climate change should make us all finally realize 
the truth that globalization is not a choice. Globalization is a fact of life and we cannot turn our backs on it by hiding behind national borders as so many try to do. Quite simply, while we all believe in national sovereignty, we must recognize that collective action, that is to say working together, will be required if we're gonna be able to deal with the problems that are beyond the capacity of any one country to handle them no matter how powerful that country is. So the question is, how do we get there? We can work together. Bilateral meetings between the superpowers, that's to say the US and China, won't do the trick. And the number of players make it difficult for the United Nations to do it alone. It's within this context that I believe the G20 must take the lead. The G20 is not without its own issues. It's a difficult table to work around. Its members have difference have differences in terms of values, in terms of interests and political agendas. But nonetheless, the G20 represents 85% of the world's GDP, two thirds of the world's population, and unfortunately, 80% of its global emissions. In short, the G20 is a representative and realistic core that provides the best opportunity I believe the world has today to make globalization work. En bref, le G20 est un forum représentatif et réaliste qui offre la meilleure plateforme possible afin de s'assurer que la mondialisation fonctionne pour tous. La question est claire. Comment le G20 peut-il jouer son rôle essentiel d'intervenant en temps de crise? The question that we have to face up to, I believe, is what is the strategy G20 countries should adapt and should adopt when facing climate change and the current pandemic? And I believe the answer is to lay out a foundation for action without delay. And so let's begin with climate change, which waits for no one. Year, off, year after year, the world comes together at the UN climate conferences to drive the global effort on climate change. We see environment ministries from around the world, including Canada's, who are top flight, by the way, working to advance their ideas. Share, they share expertise on how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. They track each other's efforts and they push the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Despite all of this, however, the reports from Paris, and we all know this, are mixed. Now, clearly we should take advantage of the United States having <clears throat> disappeared for about five, four or five years, is now has now rejoined the agreement. But what is also required is strong leadership from the G20 itself. Because without that strong leadership, discussions and negotiations at the United Nations will focus too much on what divides us rather than what unites us. Unfortunately, implementation, as always, is the sacrificial lamb. But imp implementation is why there are government and en environment ministers at the G20. And as Canada has said, they have to work together. Those environment ministers have to set aside their differences. They've got to respond to the need to break through log jams, recognizing that climate change is a battle that comes at us from all sides. Success will not come from a communique. It won't happen at all unless environment ministers collaborate on a sustained basis, holding each other to account and building the trust and the credibility of their respective climate plans. To be quite frank, and I think it's something that should be given some thought, it is not outside the realm of possibility that the urgency to address implementation as opposed to simply summit communiques might demand the creation of a new mechanism, an oversight body, specifically focused on implementation, holding countries accountable for their commitments and building the credibility of national climate plans. The precedent for a mechanism like this exists, but exists primarily within the realm of finance ministers. The time of Bretton Woods, when finance needed a body like the IMF, as an example, it was created. Later on, the 1997 Asian financial crisis needed the G20 
and the G7 finance ministers and central bank governors created it. And later, later on, when the G20 needed the Financial Stability Board at the time of the 2008 financial crisis, which was one of the major crises, it created it. If we can accept that additional institutional oversight is required to ensure productive finance, it doesn't make much sense as far as I'm concerned to say that we cannot follow a similar path to protect the environment. Quite simply, whatever we do for the economy through the Financial Stability Board, the World Bank or the IMF, the environment will require at a minimum the same degree of honed global oversight and capacity. With that, let's move on to the next crisis that we face, which is COVID-19. But let's talk about what I believe is really an organization which can play a much larger role than it is now. And that is the World Health Organization. Let me explain. To begin with, in individual countries, to the extent possible, must have comprehensive domestic scientific research capacity. That's Canada. Providing them with the first lines of defense and the full breadth of tomorrow's tools at their disposal. And we're close, but we're, a long, we're still a way away. Furthermore, these national research bodies that I've just talked about should be the national level partners of the WHO. This will enable the WHO to truly become the center of the world's response to global disease, connecting the research facilities of individual countries and ensuring all are living up to their commitments. In other words, the WHO has to have a tie-in to all of these national research bodies so that they know what's happening and so that if in fact something wrong is happening, they are able to organize to, make, to meet it. In this context, we can no longer treat the WHO as somebody's charity. We need to treat it the same way that we treat the World Bank Group, first in terms of its role and then in terms of its funding structure. At the present time, the majority of the WHO's funding comes from voluntary contributions with only 17% comes from assessed contributions. Unlike the World Bank Group, which is funded predominantly by a quota system. Now, many argue that this limits, and it really does limit, the global operations of the WHO because the contributions that it receives, it doesn't control. They're not focused on where the WHO feels that the future need is great greatest. And it is that ability to anticipate what lies ahead that is so crucial and so missing. As a result, if we're gonna bolster the strength of the WHO, it must be able to put the majority of its funds where it anticipates the greatest need will be. This is important, not only to establish the stability of its funding, but also to establish in the world's eyes that the WHO is a critical institution that must be involved in the planning and research on global health. All of this, such that it will be able to keep momentum going after a crisis has come, preparing the world for the next inning. In short, we've got to learn from our mistakes and we're not going to do it if as soon as something is over and we've got to calm, we can say, oh God, let's forget about that. The last point that I would make about the WHO is one that is especially pertinent for Canada. And that is the research it's conducting on the health impact of climate change, for which I congratulate the organization. It, and I'm so glad that, and to acknowledge the three fires lands that we're on as was mentioned, because both domestically and internationally, scientific evidence has established clear links between health and climate change. Both domestically and internationally, this is true. But as Canadians know, the indigenous people of our land have been warning us of this link for decades. I believe if Canada were to give more weight to the knowledge of the land and its waters held by the indigenous people, it would be to the benefit of all of us, including our medical and scientific communities, 
as we should do now. In the same vein, on another subject, but looking ahead as well, the Independent Panel for Pandemic Pre Preparedness and Response has just issued a very strong interim report which highlighted some of the failures of the global response to COVID-19. It's imperative that we heed its suggestions and that we give weight to their analysis. One of the issues addressed in the report was the shortage of essential supplies. And I quote from their report, major weaknesses in the global supply chain have been revealed. It's estimated that in June, 2020, around, only around one fifth of the global demand for personal protective equipment and test kits have been met. We all know that story. This, this report speaks in a global context, but we all know that we had exactly the same difficulty in Canada. The answer is to ensure that the Canadian private sector is capable of adapting to needs as they arise, and that they're ready to pivot and adapt assembly lines to the production of PPEs and essential equipment, such as ventilators. I believe that Canadian industry is prepared to respond to this need, but we must work out the details beforehand. This is not the kind of thing that you can wait for the last minute, wait till the problem that you can do. And within that context, talking about gaps, I, I think all, all I can tell you is that senior care, and I know I'm there every single one of every Canadian listening to this, we are all appalled by what we learned in terms of about senior care. And that must never, never happen again. And now I'm going to close with a brief comment on one of the most important issues of all, vaccines. One of the dynamics that are constantly at play is the massive economic discrepancy between the various regions of the world and the effect that this has on the ability of many countries to react to the needs of public health. Now this cannot be ignored because health is not only a huge moral issue, it is one of the most important economic issues we face. And it's imperative that we understand the ramifications of this. For instance, we all recognize the importance of vaccines from a health point of view. And most of us understand the degree to which vaccines are an essential part of our economic recovery. However, many fail to understand the global economic devastation that will come from unequal vaccine distribution in the developing world. This is something that we should discuss today. We're talking about how the world has to come to deal with issues that are beyond the capacity of any one country or any one region. Certainly what we're seeing in vaccines demonstrates that case. Soyons clairs, la vaccination est importante. Du point de vue de la santé, toutefois, c'est aussi d'une énorme importance pour l'économie. The Secretary General of the International Chamber of Commerce, I will close in a minute, John Denton said, and I quote, purchasing vaccines for the developing world isn't an act of generosity by the world's nations. It's an essential investment for governments to make, to make if they want to revive their domestic economies. Let there be no doubt, unequal vaccine distribution anywhere is a moral issue and it's a health crisis, but it is also a severe threat to the health of the global economy and to all of the communities we live in. And anyone who doubts this should look at the balance sheet of virtually every country in the world. And this is not just today's issue. We are living through a world, the world of COVID-19 and its mutations. And studies have shown the regions that get their, their vaccines later than other people. are the, they, These are the areas that become the fertile fields for the mutations for the variants that we're now seeing. And it will not be long before those mutations come back to us. All of this to, to repeat, that the initiatives we must deal with rise above the petty words of a communique. They have to fuel real action. The pandemic future, the changement climatique, la pauvreté, l'économie mondiale, doit les voici. Les questions sur lesquelles le G20 doit agir maintenant. In summary then, the world has changed and we have entered a new era. There is only one way forward. Countries must recognize how much they gain from acting together. The longer we delay, the more insurmountable the mountain becomes. Future pandemics, climate change, poverty in the global economy, the G20 must act now. And with that, 
I've spoken long enough. The chair is here. The time for our discussion has arrived. Thank you very much. I think I'm on now. I think I want to just speak for everybody um, to the Right Honorable Paul Martin and say enormous thank you for that. That was a great start to what this discussion is going to be. Can everyone hear me? Am I on? Make sure of that first. Yes. Give me give me a sign. You're on. Sign. All right. So thank you for that sign. Um, and uh, just hello to everybody on. Uh, it's a beautiful day here in Toronto. I hope wherever you are, all five or six or 700 of you, it's a beautiful day there as well. And uh, just a reminder for those who might be joining um, that, and I understand there have been some issues trying to get on. There is a, a way to take part in this discussion all day. There's a Q&A button at the bottom. You can see it on that, that bar at the bottom of your screen. And uh, if you push that, you'll see that already there are a lot of people involved in the chat um, and asking questions. And there will be a chance to address in each of these sessions, including this one, a chance for you to ask questions at the end. So uh, that is there for you. And uh, I want to go right into, I have, I have lots of questions. So I want to begin right away with, uh, with Mr. Martin. And it's just a pleasure once again, sir, to, <laughs> I wish we could see each other. We've crossed paths many times and it's always a pleasure to, uh, to encounter you. You talk about real action. That's where you want to see this go. And I, and these two issues of the, the pandemic and then the, the larger thing of climate change. And many people have pointed out that perhaps the pandemic is a kind of dress rehearsal for the a far larger, really far larger crisis that we may be facing coming into with climate change. And I wonder, are, as far as real action, as far as things that you're seeing, is, if this is a dress rehearsal um, in COVID-19 to see how societies, communities, nations, global community responds, do you see hopefulness in that? Are you seeing a response that goes beyond vaccine nationalism, beyond finger pointing and calling it the Chinese virus? What signs do you see that it's possible that this global movement, that this, this global society can come together to tackle something as large as climate change? Um, well, if, you, if your question is <clears throat> what we're seeing happening um, with COVID as an indication, what does that tell us in terms of climate change? Um, I would be reasonably um, encouraged. And the reason that I would be reasonably encouraged is that as we see even today, this extreme nationalism in terms of the vaccines um, and that, uh, and, and what, but what I've, what I've really also seen is a lot of people fighting back and a lot of really important studies basically saying, hey, listen, you cannot deny uh, the emerging economies. You cannot deny the, the poor countries access to these vaccines. And what they have pointed out are the consequences within our own economies of, uh, of, of stopping people getting those vaccines. So what they're pointing out, they're not making the moral argument, but they are making the economic argument. They're making the realistic argument that if you cut, and this will be the same thing in terms of if we don't work together on climate change, if country A decides to deal with climate change and country B doesn't, you can rest assured there will be tariff wars, there will be the, all of the bad things that are going to happen. And it's been very clear that people are going to enforce that we act together. That doesn't mean there aren't going to be a lot of countries that are going to take an action uh, to do it. But let's face it, every so often you can expect to see an election where the people who do it, and we've seen that south of the border. And so I think that there is, yes, there's a debate that's gonna come, but I feel that what we've seen and, and all of the studies that have come out on the vaccines, I think demonstrate that when we go from health to climate change, um, that we will react positively because it'll be so much in our interest to do so. And are you seeing Canada taking up that challenge? To, because we're, we're seeing a lot of pressure on the federal government to get the everyone vaccinated they, almost on a daily basis. The opposition is hammering Mr. Trudeau saying, why are we aren't doing as well as Israel or Great Britain or the United States? And so there's this pressure to compete with other countries to show that you are getting more people vaccinated than somebody else. That idea that take care of yourselves, take the, the look at your own needs before you regard others, do you think that that's helpful? 
Well, I, if it, it, do I, is it, it, obviously not. I mean, it, but it's, it's per, per, very understandable that people are gonna say, you've got to take care of Canadians. Um, and, I, and that's a fair statement. Um, but um, I think that the prime minister, I, the government has made it very clear that it recognizes that we all have a global responsibility and that we will be hurt by if, if that global responsibility fails. So I think the debate takes place. I think that it's understandable in terms of, in terms of the vaccines uh, that people want to see to make sure that Canada, it takes care of, of itself. Part of the problem there though, I think is going to have to build up the debate that we've got to have the, the labs. We've got to have the research capacities. We've got to basically have the capacity within our own country, not to have to rely on everybody else because we're at where we are a wealthy country and we, there's an area in which we can, I think we should be acting. So if the question, if the question you're saying is, listen, the, the government makes it very clear that it's going, it wants to take care of Canadians. It also makes it very clear that it recognizes that responsibility. That's the right answer. Um, and that there are people out there who were saying, well, let's make sure Canada is taken care of. Um, I think that you, you can expect that that kind of thing is going to happen. It's just that what we've got to do is to point out that that can't be the final answer. Okay, so this year, vaccine nationalism, there's other uh, forces of that nature you talked about. It was very interesting about uh, the idea of a new mechanism, uh, the G20 taking on a larger force for good that goes beyond being a photo op, which you've, you've warned that the GT, G20 could be reduced to that if it did, doesn't find its way. And you've mentioned that in the past. Also a new role for the WHO, very important ideas. But as you've just hinted that what, one of the most powerful counter forces to what that what G20 and multilateralism, globalism, globalization can do is that ultranationalism that we're seeing growing, populism, and members of the G20, Brazil, India, Russia, uh, even parts of the European Union, very strong populist ultranationalist voices and pressures there. So we're seeing leaders who are more inclined to close doors, to blame the other, to shut out others. So how can the G20, because those members are, are part of it, right? And so how can they be persuaded to move in the other direction before, so that you can make this G20 the force for good that you're describing? Well, this is the importance of the mechanism that I talked about. Um, fundamentally, you know, um, governments are going to have elections. During those elections, they, they, they're liable to forget some of the, the, major, the, the, the major items that are long-term uh, long uh, benefits. Um, and what you sometimes need, and this is the port reason for the importance of the multilateral institutions. The multilateral institution doesn't run for election. The multilateral institution can take on a problem and can take a long perspective on that problem can basically say, we've got to act now because the benefits, we're going to see the benefits in a decade. It can say, take, take on a project and say, we just can't drop it because three countries have had an election. What they will be is they will constantly be reacting and essentially focusing on the need to maintain action. Uh, and that will be a huge uh, 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 advantage to those countries that want to continue to do that. Um, I, hate to give the finance exa examples, but that's where the, these institutions work the best. The fact of the matter is the IMF will tell a country if that country is uh, in, in uh, making a mistake, if that country is simply giving in to the easiest answer, they'll come back and they'll say, look, you got to deal with this. Um, and what that will do is that will fo focus on those countries then that want to make sure that the world works. The independent mechanism, the multilateral institution, um, can play a huge role. That's one of the roles in terms of COVID that the, that the, um, the WHO has to play. And it's one of the reasons that when the WHO has got so much of its financing from voluntary contributors who've got an ax to grind, that the, the, the WHO can't play that role in terms of uh, health care that the IMF uh, can play in terms of finance. And that's why I think that it's got to be given it has to be given a much better um, degree of funding, and it has to be guaranteed funding, not simply based on somebody else's charity. But, and, and we see a role for Canada, and I'm going to ask you about that in a moment, but this 
but this idea that there that, that you can do that within that you can persuade within the G20 to have um, this large give this larger role to this new mechanism, which is fascinating. I hope that gets some discussion as the day goes on, and that the WHO should have some teeth for once. Um, the same time, again, going back to these forces within the organization itself, these, these populist forces is a very ugly face of ultranationalism we're often seeing. So I think what a lot of people in this and this listening to this would like to know what role you think Canada should be playing in developing this new mechanism or giving WHO some teeth. Well, first of all, what you have to do is that that's got to be part of that's that's got to be part of the role that you've given it. But then it comes down to the ability to make the argument. So let's just go back. When you're saying that people are going to argue uh, that um, I need the vaccines, don't give them to don't give them to this poor country over here. And the argument is how does a how does a government or how does any kind of a body say I'm going to make sure that people are taken care of? My first responsibility is to Canadians, but I'm going to make sure that others others are taken care of. And the and then you make the power of the argument. And the argument isn't only a moral argument. It's, it's essentially, it's in your interest to do, uh, to, be, to be responsible. And this is where mutations come in, variants come in. The, the, not, it has been demonstrated that one of the principal source for variants um, uh, or mutations is, going, is really going to be those, those countries which didn't get the vaccines when everybody else did. Um, and then finally, were, they were finally, they started to get them but those mutations were allowed to take place within those countries. They didn't take place here, they took place there because there were no vaccines. And all of a sudden what you start seeing is mutations from some country that didn't get the vaccines. They may get the vaccines, but the mutation is now there and it's starting to invade North America, Europe, wherever you want. That's an argument that anybody can understand. And so what you really, what this body can do is to argue to a country, look, you know, you're, give, you're making sure that country A has a vaccine, which wouldn't have it, is going to save your children, going to save the next generation, because the variants will not develop. Those are the kinds of arguments and any one of these issues that you've got to be able to bring. You don't have the ability to bring those arguments unless you've been able to do the research work, unless you've got the capacity, and you won't have that research work, you won't have that capacity if you're not funding those independent organizations now. You can't do it when it's late, too late. Do you see Canada playing a leadership role in that? Because we have in the past, you were one of the founders, the architects of G20. Canada as history, as you know, the, of, of punching above its weight as the phrase goes. Where is the Canadian leadership on doing exactly what you just described, which is to say, in your face way, you're not going to be able to protect your population unless you're willing to make sure and ensure that others are protected. We're even seeing uh, the new president, Joe Biden, talking in terms of getting his people vaccinated first. You've said that that's, you know, we do that, like we tell you, 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 you put a mask on yourself first before you put it on the kid on the airplane sort of thing. But at the same time, where is the Canadian role in actually being in the faces of people saying we need to be taking a larger role in taking care of others as well as ourselves. The reason that that I put so much emphasis on the on the G20 is that Canada can play a very important role within the G20. Uh, Canada has status there um, and within the G20 there are a lot of countries who want to play the same role we think that Canada should play and they, then they can come and they, they will come together. And I believe that if what we do is we establish, establish that kind of ethic in the G20, um, and, and, and that, that we'll be able to do it. I mean, what happened to the G20 very clearly is that all of a sudden out of the clear blue sky, the former US president walked away um, uh, from climate change, walked away from almost everything that was long-term and good. I really do believe that if that had not happened, if the U.S. had maintained the kind of policies that it had maintained since 1945, this would be a much easier battle. Right now, I think that it's Canada's role to bring that battle back to the uh, back to the table. And I believe that if it's done, um, that you'll find eventually the Americans will will try to take it over, but they'll, they'll certainly rejoin that. Um, I think that the Europeans, and I think very much that the Europeans will do that. And so you'll start to see that. And I think that it's conceivable 
um, uh, you, you know, that parts, uh, there, there are certainly bodies within China that would like to see that happen. Uh, there was the previous government uh, uh, was very, very strong in that way. The, the previous government in China, uh, when we were kind of get the G20 up and running, was a very large supporter. And they were a very large supporter because they recognized the, the, the global role that G20 can play. And I think that Canada has a huge position within the G20. And I think that they can essentially, I mean, they've got to work at it, but I think when, when Canada works at it, it'll work. It'll right. And I just I ask you what, about one last area before we go to questions from participants. And that's another force that is very important and that's the grassroots. And we are seeing that uh, the street protests um, and I'm not talking about the extreme fringe, though I think that that is something that, has to, that can't be ignored, but that there, there is a main, there's a grassroots movement, whether it's Idle No More, whether it's Occupy, whether it's the protests we've seen at G20 summits routinely, that they don't trust these large organizations, don't trust globalization, don't trust the G20, and don't trust them to be taking care of people. And so you're increasingly going to see that loss of faith and which maybe it kind of, it kind of don't even know about how we restore that faith in the kind of system multilateralism you're describing because people have lost that faith and we're seeing it on the street and those movements can't be ignored or brushed off. So just how do you bring people back? And how, do you, how do you restore that lost faith we have in these institutions? Well, first of all, you recognize that some of the times the, the, the lost faith actually had some substance to it. Um, if you want to take a look at it in the 2008 financial crisis in the United States, it was, there's no doubt about it that what, what the, the final solution was, was to preserve the banks, preserve, preserve the large financial institutions and essentially leave a lot of people lose their mortgages and lose their houses. Um, and so you've got to be prepared to say there may be some merit behind that, but Fundamentally, I believe that if the body that we're talking about is able to make the argument, the, I think the most powerful argument in terms of the vaccines is the whole question of variants and, and mutations and how they can grow up, if, how they can develop if in fact you haven't got, uh, if people don't get a vaccine early enough, then what you're simply doing is creating a whole market for the mu mutation. Um, I, I think it's a function of the quality of your argument. You can't, you're not going to lie to people. You're not going to say if you do this, uh, something's going to happen. It, it, but it, what will hurt you is if you say this to people and, and what you then say doesn't happen, then they're going to lose confidence in you. So it has totally to do with the capacity of the organization. I think there's a lot of work that G20 has to do to make it happen. Um, but I also believe that there is not another organization better position to do it than the, 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 the G20. Surely to God, we don't wanna to have to create another organization. It'll take us five years to agree in the membership. And so we, 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 we have to do it. I think Canada can play a strong role there. Um, that's, those are my questions. And I think Doug West is uh, somewhere there. Mr. Martin, if you, thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed speaking with you. I, I'm gonna stay here in case there, I'm needed for something, but I'm gonna turn this over to Doug. Thank you, Carol. Um, wow. I, uh, first of all, I want to apologize for everyone having trouble getting in. I think it's now open and people are getting in. We have 25 questions. I think I'll ask all of them. How's that? No, we have about, 20, we have about 15 minutes or so. Um, so I've culled them down to three. If we can get to the three, that would be terrific. I'll start with this one. How's that? From Michael Barkley. He says, a common spoken about path forward at this time is changing older finance models to one based on modern monetary theory, which will allow funding pandemic management and climate fighting that does not generate problems that the older models have, in particular, the 2008 crisis and massive inequality. Do you see a role for modern monetary theory? Overwhelmingly, and in fact, <laughs> there isn't, there's not a, a country in the world that I can think of at the present time, including Canada, uh, that isn't using modern monetary theory um, and it's working. Um, and so that uh, it's not a question is, uh, are, is it working? It's working. 
and it's happening. Uh, and what it, do, what it will give government uh, is affect fundamentally the chance um, to, to, to basically preserve economies, preserve people's lives, so that when the vaccines start to take hold, um, you're not you're, you're not starting from that deep uh, that deep in, in a hole. Uh, the, I believe that I mean, sooner, sooner or later, um, all of this debt is going to be paid back. But as long as, as long as uh, economic growth is greater than the interest rates, the, con the countries, will, countries will be able to handle uh, the debt created by the modern uh, monetary theory. And uh, fundamentally, we will be able to develop those economies. Now, it's going to not take them tomorrow. It's going to take years. But if we hadn't been able to spend this money, which is a, a funny, the money that's come from the helicopter, if they, we hadn't been able to spend this money, we would not have economies in a position or people in a position to essentially start to turn things around once the vaccines had taken place. Um, so my, my answer is the fact not only can it happen, it's happening and it's going to work. Okay. Another question comes from Aaron Ames. Hi, uh, PM Martin. We seem to be a, experiencing a jurisdictional debate in respect to fixing major economic and social issues during COVID. For example, our long-term care system in crisis, our labor protections and rights. What advice would you give to the citizens and governments who want to push for better standards and outcomes? I, th I think that I think they're there. Um, the, you know, the, the senior care, I, I think they were talking about long term. I, I'm assuming they're talking about senior care. Yes. I don't think there isn't. I'm sure I think I suspect you were shocked by it. I was shocked by it. I don't think there's a Canadian who really f understood the degree in what those long term senior homes were in. And as that came in, that deplorable news that came through the treatment of our seniors, I think that Canadians uh, just were appalled. Uh, and I think it, it is that, and I think that speaks very well of the country in that Canadians were appalled and they will not allow that to happen. Um, so, and I think that's where the, I think that's what the answer is. I think fundamentally Canadians are a very decent people. And mistakes are going to be made, and when those mistakes are going to be made, Canadians are going to ask uh, that 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 happen. Let me just tell you a story, if I might, about the mm -hmm. the seniors' care and what was going on. Um, there was a a news news broadcast uh, at the time, really announcing some of the terrible news in that case, and uh, my ten year old grandson just happened to watch the no the news, and then he went over, um, he came to me, and he said, uh, Papa. Just tell tell Nana, uh, tell Nana she can come and live with us anytime that she wants. And I thought, my God, what a wonderful kid! And then as he walked away, I suddenly realized that he invited his grandmother to come and live with him, but not me. So that uh, the um, uh, but the fact of the matter is, I think that decency will prevail. But I think we were all shocked by that. What the long term care? Thanks. I I think I have time for one more question. How do you feel about that? And then after the question, after you answer it, I'll give it back to Carol and she can say goodbye. How's that, Carol? Okay. Yeah. All right. Here's the last question. It's from Hamish Stewart. How does the Honorable Paul Martin think that Canada can manage populism, particularly linked to rising income inequality that most Canadians experience? What are the economic tools and actions required to create real, real wage growth and a visible rise in living standards that can dampen populism? I think that the first thing that we've got to do, there is an artificial, an artificial distinction made between social policy and economic policy. And all kinds of people will tell you that economic policy is okay, we've got to do whatever we can uh, to make sure that the economy functions, but social policy costs us money and we can't do it. Um, that's artificial and it's not true. The fact is that education is social policy. Without decent education, you're not going to have a decent economy. The, th the fact is that it, um, investing in research and development is crucial. Uh, all of these things, daycare, I mean, we, we, we have still not done the right thing by in terms of daycare, but daycare is the, is the fundamental, uh, uh, um, the fundamental step forward in terms of 
women being able to hold down uh, um, good jobs. And we should have that daycare. Families shouldn't be, shouldn't essentially have to pay a penalty because they don't have daycare. And yet, if they don't have the daycare, then you'll find out that it has a huge effect on the family's income. It has a huge, a huge effect on the ability of young children who are in fact trying to go to school. So I think the real answer to the question is to understand that most social, what we call social policy is in fact good economic policy. Uh, and that if, but it's, what it is, is good economic policy over a longer term, but without it, you're not going to, you're not going to survive. And we, we saw this in, since in all of the development of the Western economy since 1945, after the war, we, we saw the amount of money that went into building for the future and how it, how it is, uh, how it turned out. And we just got to understand and the calculation that should be made is in terms of any of any of the costs that government incurs is what will society look like in 10 years if we don't do this and what you find out almost inevitably is if you do the right spending it's got to be intelligent spending we're not talking about blowing money out the door here we're talking about intelligent spending that has essentially been worked out but that intelligent spending today which costs you pays for itself in spades within half a generation Okay. So, oh, there Sir, I am. I'm yes. All yes. right. Thank you. Um, I just will just say goodbye, but with also with tremendous uh, gratitude to the Right Honorable Paul Martin, because uh, if you're going to have a uh, an afternoon session called Raising Hope, Canada and the World. I can't imagine that you could have got done better than to have just heard what Mr. Martin had to say. And um, and I think that in the spirit of, I, I, I was just wondering how this conversation would have gone if the election had gone differently in the United States, because there is that sense that there is a, there is movement, there's a chance that there is something that all the things that Mr. Martin's talking about might be possible and so uh, yeah i think it's a, a spirited great way to what is the line you guys give the uh, a civil place to disagree <laughs> i think you've uh, you've launched that well and i i'm very grateful to have had an opportunity to discuss this with mr martin thank you and thanks to everyone who's listening thank well, you thank carol you. thank you mr martin thank you carol um we are now scheduled to take a 10 minute break during which you can go refresh yourselves and when we come back, we will have a panel for you uh, that uh, will be introduced themselves. I want to say uh, thank you again. And we're going to move now to our break. Ten minutes, it'll be timed. I see 154. We'll be back just after two. Okay? Take care. Thank you. Um, so, Doug, I can, I can. Oh, you're. Mr. Martin, you're muted. Can't hear. <laughs> okay. Mr. Martin, can good. you hear me? You can. Uh, I can hear you, Carol. I, I'm just trying to, uh, Mr. Martin, can you unmute? He's trying, yeah. Okay. Please note that you are all still live. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I, I just really was asking the question. I, what you're telling me is, is, is my uh, job is over, but if I yes. want to sit and listen, I can do that, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. I should have said I, that. I, Sorry. I, yeah. um, that was great, I have a quick Paul. question for Paul. Um, Paul, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, given um, the enormous uh, demand on the chat and Q&A, do you have um, a text of your opening remarks that you'd be prepared to uh, give us so we could mount it uh, on uh, the website so all of the viewers who were unable through no fault of their own to uh, hear it from the very beginning or who wish to hear it again cannot read it? Um, if so, uh, I could announce um, at the end of the conference that we'll be uh, making that available. Well, I, listen, John, I, yeah, I think I could do that, but I want to, I, I think I want to just clean it up a bit. Sure. Um, yeah. 
And I'm sure Madeline will um, help you uh, if you well, uh, need. Well, if, you, if, if you're looking for the magic words, Madeline will help me. Uh, that does it, John. I've absolutely. So could I have to I have to intervene here. Everyone else can see you talking to each other, which is uh, it's not what we planned. So sorry. Um, uh, everyone um, from all, all the participants can hear us. So that's great. It's great. Oh, well, well um, great. <laughs> Another <laughs> a tremendous uh, contribution, uh, Paul. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, Madeline, that was great, that was great you, Madeline. Paul. So Daniel, I guess you have to turn everybody off. Quickly, Daniel, maybe is Bill here? Thanks. Are you there, Daniel?
Okay. Wendy, you're up. How are you? Are we on now? We're back. Excellent. So I hope everybody had a brief break. It's a gorgeous, sunny, but cold day. Um, thank you so much for our participants for our first session. Want to just emphasize again to all these uh, participants at this point, um, about 240. Please direct your questions to the Q&A section rather than the chat. It just makes us it easier for us to um, tabulate them and to uh, bring them to the speakers. So with that, I'd like to introduce um, our moderator for our next session, our next panel, um, Adrian, Adrian Harewood. Adrian, are you there? I am here. Excellent. So Adrian is the co-host of CBC News in Ottawa. He attended elementary and high school um, in Ottawa and was involved in community radio, both at Carleton and Ottawa U. He's been the host of national CBC programs, such as As It Happens, Sounds Like Canada, The Current, uh, and before coming to TV, you were the host of All in the Day, the CBC uh, Radio One program in Ottawa. Adrian, thank you so much for this and on to you for the panel. Thanks so much, Wendy. Thanks for that uh, kind introduction. And it's, uh, it's an honor, it's a delight to be part of the Kuchiching uh, conference. Um, I thought I, what I'd do is I would just kind of set the terms uh, for this afternoon's talk and also to pro provide a little bit of context. Um, COVID-19 has, has wreaked havoc around the globe in the last year. Um, some 2.2 million people worldwide have died of the virus. 102 million people have contracted COVID-19 and some 56 million have recovered from it. Here in Canada, over 19,800 people have died of the coronavirus. Over 770,000 Canadians have contracted the virus so far. Uh, almost 700,000 have recovered and some 937,000 Canadians have been vaccinated. COVID-19 has devastated the world economy. The International Monetary Fund reports that the world economy shrunk by 4.4% in 2020. Uh, the IMF has called the decline the worst in 90 years since the Great Depression of the 1930s. COVID-19 has also caused major disruptions to Canada's economy. At its peak last spring, the COVID-19 shutdown directly affected 5.5 million Canadian workers, including 3 million who lost their jobs and 2.5 million who were employed but had experienced COVID-related absences from work. Stats Canada reports that the Canadian economy lost 63,000 jobs in December 2020, while the unemployment rate edged up to 8.6%. The retail and service sectors have been particularly hit hard by COVID-19. COVID-19 has caused untold psychological distress. The virus has taken a toll on our collective mental health. Millions of students, children, have spent large chunks of the school year online attending classes away from their physical schools. COVID-19 has also introduced us to different ways of working. Zoom has become the word du jour. More than ever, people are working in an online environment. It has affected the way we interact and commune. We have assembled a stellar panel uh, to talk about raising hope Canada and the world after COVID-19. Each panelist will make introductory remarks lasting approximately five minutes uh, each, followed by a 15 minute segment where I will pose some questions and then we will open uh, the floor, uh, the proverbial floor uh, for questions and comments from our audience. And that should last about 15 minutes as well. And, and we're gonna start with, with Dr. Danielle Martin. And I'm just going to introduce Dr. Martin right now. Dr. Danielle Martin is the Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Executive of Women's College Hospital, where she's also a practicing family physician. Dr. Martin's policy, clinical and academic expertise combined with her commitment to health equity have made her a highly regarded health system leader. She regularly provides expertise and formal advice to lawmakers, both nationally and abroad, of course. In 2014, many will remember her testimony before the US Senate subcommittee about the Canadian healthcare system that was viewed by some 2 million people, a few more people than, than watched the CBC Ottawa News. Um, 2 million, that's, that's quite something. We, we'd kill for those kind of numbers. Um, Dr. Martin earned a BSc at McGill University and an MD from the University of Western Ontario. Uh, she holds a Master's of Public Policy from the School of Public Policy and Governance at the University of Toronto. Uh, her book, Better Now, Six Big Ideas to Improve the Health of All Canadians, was released 
in 2017. Uh, and in conjunction with her work at WCH, Dr. Martin is an associate professor at the University of Toronto. Uh, please give a very warm welcome to Dr. Danielle Martin. Dr. Martin. Thanks so much, Adrian. And uh, it's a delight and an honor to be with all of you today. Uh, I, I am a long admirer and attendee of the Kuchichin Conference and so happy to be attending this online version today. And I know that it is poor form at Kuch to spend very much time talking about what everybody already knows or has read in uh, is the well-read group uh, in, in the various periodicals that, uh, that analyze the issues of the day. But it is perhaps worth summarizing briefly what we know about healthcare system responses to the pandemic, which I think can be summarized actually quite nicely in the old adage that every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. And in Canada, we know that we have built healthcare systems that are over-focused on hospitals and doctors, that are uh, firmly over generations have held community care, long-term care, mental health care, the well-being of low-wage essential workers, and the social determinants of health completely in our blind spots. And so we really shouldn't be surprised to have had the outcomes and the results that we've had, uh, you know, I don't need to repeat the statistics for this group, the reality that over 80% of our deaths in this country have been in long-term care, uh, the horrendous working conditions of PSWs, uh, the lowest paid and uh, 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 the group in which we have an overrepresentation of racialized workers in our, in our communities um, getting sick and, uh, and dying. And we shouldn't be surprised that globally, not just in Canada, all over the world, increasingly COVID-19 is being characterized as what's called a syndemic, not a pandemic, but a syndemic. A syndemic, of course, being a synergistic epidemic in which uh, we are dealing with multiple uh, uh, shocks to our, our health systems. The first, of course, in some ways, the easiest to deal with a biological infectious agent known as a virus. And the second being a plague of social inequality uh, that determines and shapes who gets sick and who dies. All of that is known, well-documented, not my ideas and, uh, and uh, probably things that you've all had a chance to read about and think about. But I reflected as I was uh, preparing my remarks uh, for today on the theme of today's conference, Raising Hope. And I was thinking about, you know, as a healthcare worker and as a, a leader in a hospital, um, you know, leading my own, uh, the medical leader for my own hospital's pandemic response since last January now, it's been a long year for all of us. And um, I was reflecting on this concept of hope and trying to remember if I've seen much of it around uh, in the in the day to day that we've been, uh, that we've all been experiencing. And what I wanna reflect on is that I think that the dominant frame in which we have been making decisions, both at the level of public policy and at the level of health system response has been one of terror, not of hope. And so much of the unlocking of uh, new ways of looking at and thinking about the challenges that we're facing, some of which has been extraordinarily positive, has all been in response to fear. And uh, so some examples, you know, we've seen a, a massive explosion of virtual care. Adrienne, you spoke about what it is to work on Zoom. I mean, uh, almost, uh, I think over 80% of Canadians now report that they've had an interaction with the healthcare system, either by phone or by video or some other virtual means since the, the pandemic hit. A complete transformation of the slowest sector to digitize, uh, it, one might argue, in the whole of our economy. The ways in which we have uh, seen unheard of collaboration between organizations, institutions, and regions. Uh, here in my own region, we are regularly moving patients around the system from one hospital to another as ICUs fill up with collaboration at a level that I've, I've never seen in my whole career. The sudden unlocking of home care resources to allow people to stay home rather than having them be admitted to the hospital in order to make space uh, for those who really need those beds even the advancement of a living wage for PSWs in long-term care and other sectors and the recognition that people shouldn't have to work multiple part-time contract jobs in multiple organizations just to make ends meet. All of that 
has been extraordinary progress and all of it has been in response to absolute terror of ending up in the situation that we saw our colleagues in Northern Italy, in New York, in Florida and, uh, and elsewhere, having to make the choices about who's gonna get access to that ventilator and what you're gonna do with the patients when there simply aren't any beds left to put them in. And so my question, and it's a question uh, that I hope we'll, we'll hear Thomas Homer Dixon speak about and that we can interact with uh, on the panel this afternoon is what happens when the fear fades? Uh, a moment that I can assure you I'm looking forward to as much as all the rest of you. All of these changes that we've made, how many of these are, you know, the sort of proverbial genies that we won't get back in the bottle? How much of this, um, as the fear fades, will, uh, will we see swing back to where we were before? And what are the kinds of change that we know need to happen that cannot actually be fueled by fear? the bigger, more complex structural changes that we need to make to adjust uh, our societies to be more uh, justice oriented and to address the root causes of health and illness. Can we reasonably expect that those kinds of changes can ever occur in response to fear? And if not, then it seems to me that we haven't yet learned what we need to learn from this syndemic. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Martin, for getting us off to such a a strong start. Uh, I'd now like to introduce the, the leader of the Green Party, Annamie Paul. Annamie became the leader of the party on October 3rd, 2020, the first Black Canadian and the first Jewish woman to serve as leader of a major federal political party in Canada. Uh, Ms. Paul is a lawyer and an activist who has worked on international human rights and with environmental organizations. Uh, Ms. Paul worked as an advisor at the International Criminal Court in The Hague and as a director for Crisis Action, an organization working to protect civilians in conflict zones. In Barcelona, um, Annamie Paul co-founded the BIP Hub, which assists organizations working on global challenges such as climate change. She's been associated with Action Canada, Operation Black Vote Canada, and Equal Voice Canada. She earned a BA and LLB at the University of Ottawa, was called to the bar, Ontario Bar in 1998, and earned an MA in Public Affairs at Princeton University on a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship in 2001. In addition to English, Anami Paul is fluent in French, Catalan, and Spanish. Anami Paul, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm not sure how the language has ended up on there, but we'll take it. And thank you so much for, uh, for having me here. This is my first Kucha Ching, but certainly I hope not my last. And uh, I come to you from the traditional territories of the Mississauga, the Anishinaabe, the Odnishone, and the Huron Wendat. And so I, I had been told I had 10 minutes, and, but I'm going to respect the spirit and try to uh, shrink it down. And so if I speak quickly and briefly about many big topics that I'm very excited about, that's the reason why, and hopefully we'll get to cover more in the discussion. And so I have been asked to say a few things about uh, the uh, green recovery and, and what, what might, um, how a green, green infrastructure might contribute to that, of course, it, within the lens of um, the pandemic and the post-pandemic period. And uh, just to echo what we just heard, there is no question that the, the question that we are being asked every single day, whether it's in the context of long-term care or whether it's in the context uh, of our warming planets or whether it's in the context of how we're going to get through this uh, pandemic together. The question we're being asked every day is what is a life worth and what will we do? What are we prepared to do to protect it? Uh, not just human life, but life on this planet both in the short term and also in the long term. Uh, that's a question that uh, is constantly being asked and it's constantly going to have to be answered in the days and weeks to month and months ahead. And I also hope that uh, we come up with the right answer and that we commit to the permanent structural changes that we need that are going to be able to support uh, the right answer. And so just very briefly then uh, with respect to to the climate and, and what we've learned, I would just say perhaps more than anything, what we have learned is that we are all interconnected and things are all interconnected. Uh, that the decisions we make today, we have to live with for a long time and the decisions that are made half a world away have an impact on us right here. 
And while it's too early to be speaking in the past tense about the pandemic, it certainly is not too, uh, too early to start learning from it. And so uh, one of the key lessons that we, I hope we have learned, but we certainly have seen the, the benefits of during this pandemic is that it is possible still to do extraordinary things at a breakneck speed when we decide to cooperate and collaborate, uh, whether that is across levels of government or whether that's within our communities, uh, we are able to mobilize in order to address uh, uh, massive uh, and what may be seemingly intractable challenges. And that is the spirit that we need to take with us into the post pandemic period, because we will continue to face uh, many, many challenges, many unprecedented challenges uh, in, uh, in the, the game, the weeks, the months uh, and the years ahead. So right now, you know, if we're, if we're looking for glimmers of, of hope, uh, one of them is that I believe and our party believes that we have the opportunity of a lifetime. Uh, we did not expect to have it at this moment, but we had the opportunity of a lifetime to kickstart our transition towards uh, a more sustainable, uh, more green economy and society, one that allows us to live within our finite resources, um, one that sets us up for the economy of the future, and one that allows us to uh, resoundingly and permanently um, stop warming our planet and tackle the climate emergency. We know that in the months to come as we head into the post-pandemic period, and we're all looking forward to that um, happening sooner rather than later, we know that we're going to be spending unprecedented amounts of money to stimulate our economy and to kickstart it. And so this is the moment for us to be using that money as wisely as we can, and that is by investing in a green recovery. Uh, this green recovery is one that we know is being planned all around the world. Uh, we have all of our international peers pretty much uh, that are planning their uh, post-pandemic recovery in the context of a green recovery. And this is our opportunity to do the same and for exactly the same reasons. Uh, because the fact of the matter is we are not where we need to be. We are not uh, leading in this area and we are not doing our fair share. And it's very, very stress frustrating to see Canada continue to fall behind in the race to design a green recovery and the, um, the economic and social benefits that come along with that. And so where do we need to, to be? It's, it's pretty simple. And again, I think people who are watching this know the answer. So I'll just say plainly, what we need to do is get to a net zero economy as quickly as possible. And this is, when we say net zero, we're talking about uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And between now and 2030, we need to be looking to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 60%. Uh, this is a target that has more or less been set by the 27 countries of the EU. Uh, the UK has a target of 68% reductions. Um, so this is something that, uh, again, our international peers have already committed to and we have not. What we need for this is regulatory infrastructure. Uh, we need regulatory infrastructure and we need physical infrastructure. So when we talk about the infrastructure, it's it, those two themes. In terms of regulatory infrastructure, uh, carbon, the carbon tax, carbon tax and rebate is one of the most cost effective and the most efficient way and most catalytic way for us to get to, um, get to net zero. It's part of the solution, but it is a critical part of the solution. I also called for last year and it seems to have picked up and it's in, it has been um, incorporated into the government's uh, climate plan, uh, the proposal for a carbon border. Uh, I want to see us working very closely with the United States to develop a North American carbon border, which would protect our workers and our businesses while at the same time giving Canada a chance for leadership and incentivizing other countries uh, to effectively price their own carbon. Um, this is one of the things, you know, Canada always should be looking for opportunities globally, not only to lead, but to punch above its weight. And this is one of the ways that, uh, that we can do that. And we have a partner now in the United States. And I would love to see us follow the example that we've seen with President Biden in his first um, week or so in office. We need our own climate science officer. We should have our own inner cabinet focused on the climate. So this is the regulatory infrastructure. 
In terms of the physical infrastructure, uh, we are committed to a national electricity grid that runs on 100% uh, renewable energies. We're already very close to it and Canada can be a global leader in that. And so that is an investment that we'd want to see and investments in clean tech and renewables. This is the kind of thing in the context of a pand post pandemic recovery, it creates the short term jobs uh, that you need to kickstart an economy post recession, as well as the long term jobs, the long term better paying jobs of the future. And um, finally, public transportation reinvesting in in uh, in greening our public transportation, creating a national zero emissions uh, vehicle uh, charging network, as well as ensuring that we have the rail and bus routes. Uh, and this perhaps uh, allows me to transition into the connection. Uh, this is something that is good for the climate, but it's also something that is good for social justice. And we can never forget that there is no possibility of uh, social, sorry, of climate justice without social justice. And so as we build the regulatory and physical infrastructure to support a green recovery, we cannot forget that at the same time, we need to uh, invest in completing our social safety net whether it's a guaranteed livable income, universal long-term care, um, making sure that the bailouts uh, that we're, we're providing are going to be uh, focused on the workers. And of course, reconciliation. These things need to be at the heart of a post-COVID recovery uh, because they connect with each other. And just one quick example is public transportation. One of the key um, calls, to, uh, calls to action in the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls report, of course, was to ensure that there were public uh, transportation routes, particularly in rural areas, to protect uh, women, Indigenous women and girls uh, from the violence uh, that also often accompanies having to hitchhike, for instance. So we have the solutions. Um, this is a good news, exciting story that we can tell about the post-pandemic recovery. And we need that story, of course, we have the solutions. What we really need now is leadership at the highest levels because government and, and our, our political leadership are absolutely going to be key elements in implementing these solutions. And so uh, that, though, that has to be a big focus of, of the work uh, that those of us do that are really committed to seeing this um, greener, uh, more sustainable future for Canada and for the rest of the world. Thank you. I think you might be on mute, Adrian. Oh, enemy Paul, thank you for that. I, no, I was just saying thank you very much for that uh, condensed version of your 10-minute uh, speech. That, that was uh, very well done. Th thanks so much for your succinct uh, remarks there. We really do appreciate it. Josh Yardison is the National Human and Social Services Leader at Deloitte Canada. His previous roles include partner at KPMG, Vice President of Policy and Government Relations for the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, and Policy Director at the Moat Centre at the University of Toronto. His career history includes public service, academic and advocacy. As a thought leader, uh, Josh Yardison has written and lectured extensively on Ontario politics and government, uh, public sector transformation and regulatory reform among the most pressing policy challenges facing Canada and Ontario. He grew up in rural Alberta during a deep recession. Like many families, he relied on government supports during this period. This is why he firmly believes in the value of government and also believes that enhancing the efficacy of the Canadian social safety net is both a moral and economic development imperative. In this spirit, his professional and academic interests converge on the transformation of income assistance, social care and employment services so that they are more integrated, more focused on outcomes and more centered on the client and the family. Mr. Yardiston earned a PhD in political science at the University of Toronto in 2005. Josh Yardison, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, it's an honor to be here. In fact, I think my bio just, that's it. There, there, there are my comments, but. Um, so uh, in my remarks, I decided to position myself in 2030 to look retrospectively at the pandemic's impact. And there is no doubt uh, the pandemic was a pivot for the Canadian economy and its peoples on the scale uh, of the impact of World War II, viciously agreeing, agreeing with the Honourable Martin on that. Um, our, our theme today is raising hope. And in this 
spirit, I ask myself, what conditions would uh, have to be met in order for Canada to thrive in this post-pandemic world? Okay. Uh, in my view, uh, the single most important condition, and I think it's sort of a macro theme that we're touching on today, is a renewed Canadian social contract. Um, I believe a, a new social contract was, uh, was imperative, again, looking retrospectively, uh, because the pandemic exposed the median voter to once in 100 year insecurity. Okay. Uh, the accumulation of the anxiety from the pandemic created bottom-up pressure on our governments to retool the Canadian social safety net and to create the conditions of an inclusive recovery. Okay. Um, that is, there is reform of employment insurance to include non-traditional workers. There was better coordination between federal and provincial social assistance programs. Okay. Echoing uh, Prime Minister Martin, introduction of a pan-Canadian childcare uh, to support greater workforce participation. Okay. New and better programs to allow seniors to age with dignity and according to their preferences. A massive undertaking to retrain the workforce and massive investment in the green and low carbon economy. And by the way, these are recommendations in Deloitte's recent report on the future of Canada called Catalyst 2030, available to all who uh, want to Google it. Okay. A renewed social contract emerges and is necessary uh, because COVID has brought about the acceleration of that process that we call creative destruction in the economy. Uh, those businesses that were on the precipice, for the most part, sputtered and or failed. Those businesses with positive cash flows either uh, wrote it out and or invested heavily in the digitization of their value chains. Okay. Uh, the consequence of digitization is to further enhance the economic dislocation of parts of our workforce. Um, and this pattern extended beyond uh, the, the, the pandemic. Um, thankfully though, a modernized training ecosystem allowed Canada to, Canadians to retool their skills uh, portfolios. Okay. Um, but even in this, the optimistic scenario, many were left behind. Uh, however, the enhanced safety net meant that the impact of economic dislocation both at the individual level and in the aggregate societal level was blunted. So again, looking back from 2030, Canada's ability to make these adjustments was a product of its mature and resilient institutions, much admired around the world, uh, and this enhanced its prestige and influence in the global economy. Other jurisdictions who lacked the resiliency of the, uh, of the democratic institutions suffered prolonged political and economic stability as a result of the pandemic, which further exacerbated tensions in a multipolar world. Multipolar, multipolar world sorry. So, you know, looking back from 2030, this is a glass half full. Um, but again, in my view, COVID has created a rare opportunity to right size the Canadian social contract, uh, minus this right sized uh, social contract. Um, I think our outlook is a lot less favorable. And so here I think summarize what I think are some really key imperatives as we uh, uh, move forward in the next few years. So thank you. Josh, thanks so much for that. Um, I'm gonna begin this way. I think I'm gonna begin with, with, with Dr. Danielle Martin because I, I'm, I'm curious as to what this just healthcare system that you believe Canadians deserve and then that, that you would like to work in, what does that just healthcare system look like? And what is it comprised of? Well, the first question I think we have to ask ourselves is do we uh, believe in a right to health care in Canada or do we believe in a right to health? Because if what we actually care about is health, Healthcare systems, while on the list of things that we should be investing in, are not at the top of that list. And much of what we've heard Anami and Josh talking about are, are actually, you know, interventions, whether it's income, uh, modernized income supports, um, whether it's uh, support for precarious workers, whether it's childcare. I mean, these are all investments in health. 
But if we want to talk about healthcare, the first thing that we need to do is to modernize our healthcare systems to acknowledge that most people don't spend most of their time in the hospital. And as the population ages and as chronic disease continues to rise in this country, we need to shift our focus from having high performing hospitals, which are always gonna be important into understanding how do you build community-based models of care that help people to age with dignity in their homes and communities as close to home as possible. Uh, we need to bring prescription medications under Medicare. It is you know, a, a joke, frankly, that a person can come to my office, um, you know, be examined by me, receive a diagnosis, be sent for advanced imaging, that I can consult with a specialist, all of which are, are accessible to my patients. But the minute that I write them a prescription to actually treat their ailment, they're completely on their own. Um, and we need to look at uh, uh, whether it's pharmacare or other um, investments modernizing our, our systems. And so, you know, it, it really is about creating a, a vision for equity that comes down to where are the investments that you, you can make that are, um, that actually have an impact on health rather than continuing to put our resources um, into the same systems that we built in the 60s and 70s across the country. Dr. Martin, your critics will say that, that Canada, this country cannot afford a universal pharmacare program. How would you counter that? What, what's your argument for it? I would, say why none they, of, why are they I, would, I would say none of those critics would have looked at the evidence because in fact, we know, and this has been borne out through the, uh, the work of the parliamentary budget office uh, by the implementation of pharmacare panel led by uh, Dr. Eric Hoskins under the Trudeau government very recently, that it will cost less than what we currently spend if we start actually negotiating prices for our drugs that are more similar to what other countries pay. Uh, and so we are in a bizarre situation in Canada where one in five Canadian households reports that someone in that house is not taking their medicines as prescribed because of concerns about cost. All of those people who experience preventable complications of their chronic illnesses land then in our emergency departments in our family practice offices, in our, uh, in our uh, chronic care facilities, et cetera. And we are paying among the highest prices for our prescription meds in the OECD because we are not getting access to economies of scale. So a rationally constructed evidence-informed approach would actually cost us less. Now, yes, some of that money is gonna need to be shifted from its current private expenditure into the public purse. And we're gonna to have to talk about how we pay for that. But we're buying, we're not gonna end up in a situation where we don't pay for drugs in this country. We're going to pay for them. The question is, will we get a better price if you pay for yours and I pay for mine? Or will we get in a better price if we go in together? And the answer when it comes to uh, pharmaceutical policy, which has been borne out all over the world, is you get a better price when you go in together. And I mean, Paul, what's the connection between the, the Green Party's um, climate change agenda and the health of Canadians? Well, just simply put, you know, I spoke of the regulatory infrastructure that's needed, the physical, but there is also the social infrastructure as well. And I think it's really being said very, very well by the, the other panelists. Um, they're completely interconnected. And there was a time not that long ago where we did understand that when we were investing in ourselves uh, through our social programs and particularly through strong universal social programs uh, that we were investing in our future. Uh, these really are the best investments that you can make gain. I don't wanna retread over the same territory, but it's the reason for instance that we have been speaking so much about the need for universal long-term care, the need for universal pharma care, universal dental care, uh, universal post-secondary, uh, a guaranteed livable income, exactly because uh, we have got to emerge from this pandemic having taken the lessons of the price that we pay for our lack of investment in those areas. And it does cost us far more than making those investments. And so for us, um, you know, these things, as I said, we are interconnected and all of these, all of these um, policy uh, issues are interconnected. Uh, and it's why I gave the example that I did about uh, the need for public transportation, not just as a climate issue, as, a, as something to benefit the climate, but also as a social justice issue. 
So um, maybe just the last comment on that is just to say that we also know that really, if we are going to uh, create the sustained public pressure and mobilization that clearly is going to be needed to affect uh, the kind of climate, um, uh, the cl green recovery plan and, uh, and sustained climate action that we need. We need people not to be focused on having to meet their basic needs. And there's still too many people in Canada that are just focusing on getting by and they just simply don't have the bandwidth. But the money has to come from somewhere. And, and, and the question is where, how do you raise that money? Wh wh where do you get the funds from for these programs that you, you, you'd like to implement? Well, again, first, as I said, these are investments. Uh, it is not it is not cost neutral to to uh, not invest again in universal pharma care, for instance. It is not cost neutral not to invest in 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 dental care. Um, we're seeing during this pandemic, we just held a town hall with students. It certainly isn't cost neutral for us not to be helping all of the students who haven't been able to return to their post secondary studies this fall because they simply they didn't have a job this summer because of the pandemic and they simply can't afford to go back. So first we should recognize that, uh, that it's not as if we we're not already paying the price for not having these. And then the second, as I said, is that whether it is Mark Carney, our former governor of the Bank of Canada, or it is you know, the sovereign wealth funds all over the world who are turning in this direction or our international peers within the OECD, all of these people are speaking in a united voice that the best economic opportunity um, is going to be in a green recovery and investing in it now. We have to spend this money one way or another to stimulate our way out of this, um, uh, out of the, uh, this, you know, this, this uh, morbid uh, economic state uh, brought on by the pandemic. And the question, the only question that we have now is how will we spend that money? How do we get the most bang for the buck? And it is absolutely investing in a green recovery and in completing our social safety net. Josh, a recent report by RBC shows that women have been disproportionately hit yeah. by the job losses that have come with, with, with COVID-19. I think between February and October of 2020, 68,000 men joined the labor force while more than 20,000 women have left. Um, you know, the economist Armin Yelnesian is calling this a she session. What, what, are the, what are the policies that are required to get women back into the labor force right now? Yeah, no, I, I think, um, yeah, that, that, that the, the, those stats now are well known and, and, and uh, one of the tragic consequences really um, of the pandemic. Um, so uh, my view is that you certainly you would want to, and I think Paul Martin echoed this, I think it's, it's it, it, I think there's going to be greater momentum around uh, this cause, you know, the concept of some form of universal childcare, right? Um, and um, that I think is is the single most important ingredient in in, um, uh, in in making sure that the conditions for you know an inclusive recovery, uh, inclusive from a gender perspective, uh, but other uh, other segmentations within society as well, that'll be actually a critical factor. Short answer. Sorry. Okay. Um... Canada, Josh, has earmarked, I think it's $374 billion yep. uh, between federal and provincial governments in direct COVID-19 emergency spending. But almost every province right now seems to be sitting on those unspent funds. How should those funds be spent? Well, um, gee, that's a big question. Um, you know, I, I think that one of the challenges the provincial governments have right now is the fact that they're, you know, um, they are so focused on uh, both the health sector responding to the crisis, um, reach, you know, rapid responses from an income security point of view, um, that it actually is kind of hard to get money out the door. I mean, in many ways, they're bottlenecked, right? Um, so my, you know, my view is I, if they're not able to spend, it's probably because just the sheer volume of decisions that need to be made, right? And the sheer volume of dollars I need to get out the door and they're bottlenecked, bottlenecked institutional frameworks that don't allow uh, them to spend in certain, in certain ways as quickly. I mean, another factor would be and I'm, uh, is the lack of evidence, right? In terms of uh, what needs to happen on the ground beyond, for example, the well-known incidences of the emergencies and 
in, in, in the, uh, you know, the impact on, on, um, on emergency rooms, on the impact on long-term care, et cetera. But these aren't you know, necessarily quick fixes and we need to have long determined, uh, uh, not long, that's the wrong, wrong word, but determined conversations about how to fix long-term care sector, et cetera. And to throw, simply throw money at these short-term problems with the notion that you're going to create long fixes, actually, I think we more we need more deliberate dialogue around. Dr. Martin, when it comes to long-term care, what is COVID-19 revealing, perhaps, about some of the limitations of the private sector? I mean, it's well known, of course, that our uh, long-term care facilities have not all performed the same in this pandemic. And that if you have a loved one in a for-profit long-term care facility, their risk both of contracting COVID-19 and of dying of it is much higher than if they're in a not-for-profit or in a publicly owned long-term care facility. Um, and so, and actually that's not news. <laughs> we have known that the quality of care and the outcomes uh, adjusted for the populations of, of residents in these facilities are worse in for-profit than, uh, than not-for-profit long-term care facilities for decades in this country. Rates of death are higher in the for-profit, uh, in non-COVID times in the for-profit sector, uh, bed sores, uh, numbers of transfers to the emergency department, the list goes on. Um, and so, you know, in many ways, uh, these, these pre-existing cracks in the system have been sort of uh, unmasked uh, for, for the general public, but this, the evidence on this has been mounting for, for a very long time. Now, the, the question is why and what should be done about it? So uh, first of all, why a lot of it, of course, relates to uh, staffing levels, um, numbers of staff, uh, the number of hours of care that a resident gets per day and the qualifications of those staff. So it makes a difference if you have one registered nurse and then a number of uh, RPNs or PSWs on a ward versus having uh, more highly trained, highly skilled workers. All of this plays in. Um, and of course, you know, it stands to reason that uh, because the, all of these facilities get the same amount of money from government. And so the, the, the issue is, you know, where is that money going? Um, and in the in the for-profit sector, of course, some of it is going to profit. The, 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 the linked question though is about regulation, you know, because we have had this approach in Canada, which is a sort of, if, if something is entirely publicly funded, we take all kinds of responsibility for it. And if it's in the private sector, we behave as though we have no control over it whatsoever. And in fact, governments have under-regulated the whole of the long-term care sector for decades. And so, you know, should we nationalize our long-term care facilities? Maybe that's an interesting conversation to have, but it's not as though it's the only choice. Uh, we certainly have, have lots of regulatory um, uh, options at our disposal that we haven't been um, putting into place. Finally, I think we, we cannot talk seriously about long-term care and the uh, effect of, of its underfunding and under-regulation on residents without talking about its impact on workers. The people who work in long-term care are the ones who couldn't get a mask in the early days you know, we, of, of the first wave where PPE was not being delivered, people's lives at risk on, you know, in $15 an hour jobs going between multiple locations through their day, uh, trying to make ends meet with multiple part-time jobs in different long-term care facilities. And unfortunately, in many in instances, getting infected in one and then uh, uh, unknowingly spreading the virus to the next. And so uh, the conversation about taking care of our vulnerable elders cannot be divorced from a conversation about uh, providing decent working conditions and a living wage for the people who take care of our elders for a living. All of those things need to be considered. There's, there's also, if I pick this up though, I mean, Canada also dispends disproportionately large amounts on bricks and mortar long-term care homes, right? And that's a big challenge. Um, you know, we know that 90% of seniors would prefer to age in the home. And our funding models and the way we allocate spend don't allow for that. Other countries in the world pour much more money, a much greater share of money, so that people can age in home, according to aligned to seniors preference. And so this is what I mean in terms of you know, solutions. We actually need deliberate, broad-scale conversation about what we want to be when we grow up vis-a-vis -vis this new social safety net. And prioritizing aged care in home, I think, is, is part of what that new social safety net needs to look like. I see Doug is there, and, and but I, I do want to give Annemie Paul the, the last word because Annemie, I'm curious as to what 
How do you keep hope alive, uh, particularly when you're, you're being inundated with all of this overwhelming information about the, the cataclysmic effects of climate change? We, we just saw in the journal Nature, you know, that the, the nature, they, they produced a, a report saying that the planet is hotter now than it's been for at least 12,000 years, a, a, you know, a period spanning the entire development of human civilization, that, that the planet may be at its warmest, you know, for, for well, it may be at its warmest for the, for the last 125,000 years, in fact. So, so how do you, how do you give people the, the, this, this idea that they, they can actually make change in, in a fundamental way that will allow human civilization to continue uh, when they're just being, there's just this avalanche of, of, of negative, you know, indicators su suggesting that, that, that there's no hope, there's no chance. Uh, well, I'll give you two, two things. Uh, first, I take a lot of hope and inspiration out of the, the, the pandemic. Um, and by that, I mean, uh, when, when things were at their toughest and when the chips were down and when we had the opportunity to just only take care of ourselves or take care of our own and, and you know, the hell with everyone else, we didn't do that. You know, we said very clearly from the very beginning uh, to our government, uh, and to ourselves that we were ready to do whatever it took uh, to protect our communities, even if it meant tremendous personal sacrifice. And even to this day, after everything we've been through and all of the sacrifice and all that has been lost, people have still said they are willing to do more to protect their communities, willing to do more to make sure that uh, we all get through this together. And so I take a lot of inspiration from that. And I think if we can transfer that to the, uh, to the climate uh, emergency, then there is a lot of hope. And certainly as, as we have seen, as I said, that when we want to act, even on a huge thing like mobilizing an entire economy, completely changing our benefit systems, um, our social programs, uh, in fundamental ways, we're able to do it. So we can apply that um, here. And then perhaps my, my, the other hope that I, that I have and the other hope to, to give to people beyond, as I said, that this is a good news story about the green recovery. This is actually a very exciting good news story. Um, I take hope in the fact that uh, more people like myself are going to be at the table when we have these discussions because coming back to long-term <laughs> care, I'm someone who, have seen, have, who has experienced it from multiple sides. I lost my father in a for-profit long-term care facility during this pandemic, avoidably like many thousands of people. And I also have had many um, multiple generations of women in my family working as personal support workers in long-term care and some of them to this day. So imagine being able to bring that to the discussion about how we reform long-term care in our country. Uh, if we can bring more people who directly are impacted by the, the social issues that we're talking about uh, into the discussion at the highest levels, uh, there's a lot of hope in the solutions that they can come up with and their commitment to implementing them. So I, I, take, a, I take a lot of hope in, in very strange places, but it is there if you look for it. Okay, well, th thank you very much. And I'm, I'm being uh, pulled off the stage. You know, <laughs> oh, I, I, I with the hook? There's no hook. Please stay. I feel the hook. I feel the hook. So, so I, it's now time for our, our audience uh, to, to pose uh, their questions. And I know that uh, Doug has been assembling those questions. So. Doug. There have been 35 questions and there's just no way we have time. So what I've done is kind of pulled some of them together, but I still want to identify the names of the people who, who uh, answer, asked them in a, in a general way. So first of all, a comment from Ken Fike, a national pharma care program will cost less than the current system. Danielle, you're right on. So that was a, a nice comment I thought I'd share. Um, and so the first question is, is this, uh, the possibility, this is from uh, Xavier Furtado, the possibility of launching a universal basic income has received renewed attention. Do panelists see this as a feasible part of Canada's post-COVID economic recovery? And um, I, 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 you could start. I'll with, just say uh, that very uh, quickly that it's essential. It's an essential part because um, we are going through, uh, as Josh said, very um, profound and permanent uh, structural changes to to work. Even before the pandemic hit, we had to we had to be thinking about uh, how we were going to deal with uh, the changes that are going to be 
that were being uh, wrought by uh, artificial intelligence and automation, and that's only accelerated throughout the pandemic. Uh, and so, you know, whether we're talking about a just transition for workers in the energy sector or all of those that are, um, might be displaced or have been displaced uh, through automation, et cetera, um, this is absolutely a part of it. And it goes even further if you're talking about long term care and allowing people to age in place in their communities and have supports from family members, uh, a guaranteed livable income helps there as well. So this again is one of these necessary investments to ensure that there is universal coverage, uh, that no one falls through the cracks and that we have the flexibility built into our structure that allows people to make choices and pivot at different points in their lives without having to worry about meeting their basic needs. Thank you, Josh. Can you answer that question? You know, this is this is this is the this is a tough question in a sense because I think the the debate has uh, been you know really structured by a false dichotomy of there's a basic income or there's not right and there's really many many forms or gradations of income security that include forms of basic income. Um, I believe that the uh, ecosystem we have today is woefully underperforming and it creates way too many gaps that people who who, for example, exhaust their EI benefits or are forced to, you know, divest of their assets, their RRSPs, a second car, et cetera, and that just creates cycles of poverty. That is not that, that is not a good outcome, and I think that there's consensus around that. I think the, the way forward, of course, the devil's in the details. Um, you know, there are the BC government, its 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 panel on basic income just released its report. Uh, and its conclusions were such were, were really focusing on the need to target the system, right? To close gaps that exist elsewhere in the welfare state uh, and in income security, and not necessarily because of cross prohibitiveness, provide a blanket universal guarantee. So I would say the concept of a more rigorous income security safety net, yes, uh, but there are lots of design parameters that need to be worked out to make a universal basic income affordable and uh, um, at the same time, um, uh, meanwhile, enabling people to uh, us to plug other gaps in the, in the safety net. So it's a nuanced answer to a very difficult question. Dr. Martin. Two, uh, two or three things. First, there is no better investment in the health of Canadians than to eliminate poverty, period. We, we should close as many hospitals as it takes to get to to free up the money to uh to lift people out of poverty is by far the best investment you can make in health second uh we uh, we cannot seriously continue to have income security programs uh that leave as many people behind as our current programs whether you call uh, a universal basic income, you know, wh whether we're talking about mailing a check to every single Canadian, whether we're talking about uh, using the tax system to make sure that people don't fall below a certain floor, whether we're talking about extending existing benefits programs, you know, to, to people who are in precarious work, you know, there are there are many ways to do that. But the but the uh, but the notion that the design should be simple, that it should function through the tax system, and that we should stop making poor people spend all of their days filling out forms are, are clear, you know, starter, starter points for the conversation. I will say from my own experience as someone who spends a lot of time filling out forms for people, we really manage to make poverty a full-time job for people in this country. And we really manage to construct systems that are trying to keep people out of receiving benefits instead of trying to find those people who we want to begin giving benefits to and making it super easy for them to access those benefits. Uh, I think actually what I'm describing sort of sounds like a basic income guarantee, uh, but you know, uh, to Josh's point, how, how you how you define those terms, what you really mean when you say those words, um, and the and the details of the design are are going to be incredibly important, so that you don't have unintended consequences. The, the the BC panel report actually, I think, is actually a very nuanced version of what that could look like, and I encourage anyone who's interested uh, to take a look at, the, at that report and uh, and its conclusions. So one more question for everybody. Um... I've taken two together, so I, I apologize for the people who pose them. Kathleen Porter and James Desmolin asked the two questions, and I'm going to push them together. Um, 
Can the panel comment currently on what's going on in the financial markets where amateur traders are banded together by social media? Very scary situation for some people, especially people who have a kind of pension I have that's invested in the, in the, the stock market. Um, and the other part is from Kathleen that says, uh, fear is like a social contagion, but so is hope. How do we change the narrative and who should be leading this? And that'll be our last question. So we can start with Annamie again. I'll take this second part because I, I have been following out of my peripheral vision, the, the whole Robin Hood game stop, game start, stop, I think it is, uh, but not, not enough maybe to com comment um, fluently on it. So in terms of the second question, I think that's a fantastic question. And I would say that um, we see, whether it's through the polling uh, or just, I would say, in the conversations that we're having amongst ourselves, that people in Canada are, are looking for hope. They want to feel hopeful and positive about the future. They don't want to be paralyzed. And they also want us to be ambitious uh, about our future as well. And uh, what we have, unfortunately, is uh, a, a political system that is designed in a way where you don't actually need to feed hope in order to win. Um, you can micro target people with very modest promises, which are more along the lines of um, at least we're not the worst or it's just good enough uh, and still win. And so uh, we need to we need to change the calculus. And I think that perhaps the pandemic has been sufficiently disruptive uh, that it um, that it has uh, and that that message of hope is going to be more uh, more saleable. Uh, so that it is, is adopted more widely. Because I really believe very strongly that when Canada has been at its best and created its most important social programs, it has coincided uh, with a moment of, of collective positivity, of collective ambition. It always has had a strong political narrative as well. And so that's, I want to be a part of it. I'll just say that much, that I'm working to be a part of that. Uh, and it's, it's, it's something that is not um, exclusive to us. It's, it's something that's not finite. And I want to see the other, um, the other political leadership in this country joining in as well, because I think people are very, very hungry for it, particularly at this moment. Josh, next. Uh, you know, there's not an easy answer to that question. I mean, I'm not gonna deal with the first because uh, like enemy, I, I haven't been um, paying attention enough or knowledgeable enough to actually say something insightful. Uh, on the latter question, I think is equally tough. Uh, I do think though that uh, as Canadians, we need to think hard about the type of political discourse that we want. And um, I think that there is a, you know, in the grand, scare, the grand theories of change, you know, old ideas are discredited, new frames need to emerge. We need to create as many venues as possible for our idea and entrepreneurs to bring forth their visions for the future and to foment, you know, articulate debate about uh, what this country needs to look like. Um, I think that we're at that point where there's a consensus that, you know, the core contours and safety net and health are, are, are simply not good enough for Canada in 2030. So um, providing as many venues such as this, and this is a wonderful venue for these types of dialogues, I think is, is absolutely key. Um, and uh, I, you know, a critical ingredient. And finally, Dr. Martin. Well, I'll share a little anecdote, which is that, um, you know, I work in an organization that like every healthcare organization has asked things of our people in the last year that we should never, you know, have to ask. And people have worked around the clock as they have in so many other organizations and in so many other sectors doing jobs that don't look anything like what they thought their job was, working hours that they thought they would never have to work, doing things in ways that they never thought they would have to do. Um, and, you know, again, much of it motivated by fear. And when the vaccine supply hit the ground in our organization, all of these exhausted people volunteered to come out and vaccinate elders in long-term care facilities. They were willing to do it before they themselves had been vaccinated uh, because it was it the it represented hope. It represented hope for the end of this uh, phase that we're in and something new. And I, you know, in parenthetically, I will say that when the, the supply dried up, 
uh, you can imagine what the emotional response to that was. Uh, it was like having the hope pulled out from under you. So um, I, I will say that I think that no matter how hard it's been, um, uh, perhaps these circumstances that we have found ourselves in have created a, uh, uh, have sown the seeds uh, for a, a dialogue based on hope. We all need it so badly now, and maybe this is the moment actually to, to change the frame. Um, which is a really nice lead in to our final keynote speaker. Thank you very much, all of you. Um, I'm gonna give it back to Adrian to say goodbye. And then if you can throw it back to me, we'll sure. go to break, yeah. Well, I just wanna thank you all. Thank thank uh, our panelists for really elevating uh, the conversation. We, we desperately need uh, these spaces where we can have a critical dialogue, uh, but also we need to dream at this moment. We, we, need, we need to actually think about the fact that another world is possible. Uh, and, and I'm thinking about Robin D.G. Kelly, the historian at UCLA, who, who talks about the importance of freedom dreams, of, of, of dreaming of the, of the kind of world that we want to be in and that we want to see our children live in. Uh, so thank you very much for contributing to the conversation today. Your thanks for your incisive remarks. Uh, and I look forward to uh, continuing the conversation in the future. So thank you all. Well, so thank you, Adrian. It was uh, wonderfully uh, orchestrated, great panel. Uh, so please, everybody, uh, we're gonna take a 10 minute break when we come back and please stick around. Um, we're going to hear from Tad Homer Dixon. Thank you.
Hello, everybody. We're back. Um, I hope you've been talking to each other. It looks like you have. The chat function is working really, really well. So now uh, we have our third session. Um, and I'll ask Daniel to take down the slide if he can. And uh, so, and remember that afterwards, we are going to um, open up a number of breakout rooms for people to participate in um, uh, getting back in touch because there are so many people that used to go to coach that want to go to coach and come back to coach. So we're giving you some time at the end after we hear from John Curtin and Madeline Coach. So um, it is my great pleasure to introduce my good friend, Wendy Feldman who is the conference co-chair, but also is serving as the moderator for our next session. Wendy is the, the co-chair of the Kuchiching Conference, as I said, and has been volunteering with Kuchiching since 2003. She's a part-time lecturer at Hamburg College in the public administration program. Her public sector experience in the Ontario government includes cabinet office, treasury board secretariat, and several ministries. In the federal government, she served in Global Affairs Canada, in Ottawa, Paris, and at the UN, and the office of the Solicitor General Canada. Previously, Feldman was the director of research for the Institute of Public Policy, or Public Administration in Canada. She is a graduate of the Harvard Kennedy School and the University of Ottawa, and I swear I didn't know this just from meeting you, Wendy. So, Wendy, over to you. And I was in Cambridge when our speaker, Tad Homer Dixon, was at MIT. Um, I should just say that Tad and I have known each other since the days when I was at Ottawa U and he was at Carleton, yeah, a, a long and wonderful friendship. Um, uh, so today what we're going to be doing, hey Tad, what we're going to be doing is having Tad's presentation uh, a couple of my questions, and then we open the floor to your questions. And I see that um, you're keeping Doug very, very busy with lots and lots of, of questions. That's just terrific. So our, our next speaker, uh, Thomas Homer Dixon, is the director of the Cascade Institute at Royal Roads University the, and the, uh, uh, in BC and the University Research Chair of the Faculty of the Environment at the University of Waterloo. Um, Tad was first at Kuchiching in, in 2003 as well that summer. Uh, Dr. Homer Dixon's research focuses on threats to global security in the 21st century, how we can solve conflicts and innovate in response to very complex world problems. His work is highly disciplinary. His last book, his latest book is Commanding Hope, The Power We Have to Renew a World in Peril, but he was also uh, the award-winning author of The Upside of Down and The Ingenuity Gap, and environment, security, and scarcity, and violence. Dr. Homer Dixon's articles are in leading academic journals, um, as well as Foreign Policy, Scientific American, The New York Times, Financial Times, and even last week in the Globe and Mail. He consults with governments and speaks to audiences around the world. And today it's our turn to hear from him. Tad. Thank you so much, Wendy. And it's just wonderful to have you introducing me and think about all those those uh, years ago when we first met at Carleton University in the early 1980s. And hello, everybody from uh, from Machosen on the southwest corner of Vancouver Island. Uh, it's a very pleasant day here today. Um, as I begin, I want to acknowledge that I live on the the traditional lands of the Songhees Nation and the families who have lived here for thousands of years. And I, I'm going to return in my comments today to some of the issues that are raised by, uh, for instance, indigenous worldviews that I think are relevant to the challenges we face today. Uh, but it's absolutely wonderful to be part of the Kuchiching conferences again to see this effort to, to re-engage this community in the important work that it's done for, for many decades. I have a confession to make that uh, I actually, I've done a number of presentations this week, but I actually didn't formally prepare for this one because I wanted to hear what other people said. So I've been listening very carefully for the last two hours and, uh, and taking lots of notes. I have a sheet of paper in front of me here, which is uh, covered with chicken scratch notes from all the extraordinary comments people have made. It really is a, it was, it was a, a two really marvelous sessions. Uh, 
I want to bring the conversation back to the issue of hope because the title of this presentation or this session today is Raising Hope. And as Wendy mentioned, I've, I've been giving a lot of thought to hope uh, now for close to a decade. I began writing my book, Commanding Hope in 2012. I'm not gonna speak a lot about the, the specific arguments in that book right at the moment, uh, because I think Wendy has some questions and we can get into those arguments in, in the conversation later. But I want to put at the center of my presentation the question that Adrian just asked in the last session. What place is there for hope in this world? How are we going to preserve it when we are faced with these extraordinarily frightening challenges that are converging on us from every quarter, it seems? Uh, Daniel Martin spoke of a sin crisis, a syndemic, I think is the term she used. The, 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 the synchronicity of an economic crisis of economic inequality and disparity and the pandemic and how the two things are accentuating each other. I think that's a very powerful notion. Uh, in the work that I'm doing right now with some researchers around the world, we're speaking in terms of a poly crisis, poly crisis. Uh, and it consists of many components which are not entirely independent of each other. There's of course the pandemic that we are experiencing right now and it has disrupted the lives of so many people in the world. There is the extraordinary crisis of the climate change, a slower developing problem, but one that could literally be an existential threat to human civilization. Uh, worsening and deep problems of economic and racial inequality in our societies, uh, political polarization, and, and uh, the inability of groups to talk to each other to solve their common problems, and rising authoritarian populism and authoritarian nationalism around the world. This is a pretty rich and dangerous stew, a mixture of crises. Which, and, I, and I think the term polycrisis is a quite a useful way of thinking about it. These, these problems are all converging on us simultaneously, but they, it, this isn't best described as a perfect storm because the metaphor of a perfect storm makes it sound as if the individual crises are independent of each other. But actually these crises are interacting as Daniel Martin indicated in very powerful ways. They reinforce each other and make the total impact much larger. So when we're thinking about hope and Canada's role in, in, in preserving hope in the world, uh, what does Canada have to offer in response to this poly crisis? And I, I was fascinated by the Honorable Paul Martin's comments, his, his remarks about the role that Canada could play in uh, enhancing institutional oversight for climate change and other environmental problems through, for instance, the G20 strengthening the World Health Organization, all of these things are vitally important. But then uh, moderator Carol Off came back and, and said, you know, but what about this pressure, the competition between nations, the pressure to take care of yourselves first, the closed doors and to shut others out? And how is that, how is that uh, compatible with this idea of a larger common collective action in response to challenges such as the pandemic and climate change. And I think that's, that's the nub of the problem. These collective action problems require, like climate change and the pandemic and, and the others I've been speaking of, require collective action. They require us to see ourselves as a common entity, a common unity to respond uh, uh, and, and to, to share the obligations and to share the burdens of those obligations among ourselves to produce ultimately win-win results for the entire global community. But, but the, immediate, the immediate instinct and impulse is to protect ourselves, whether it's our families, our communities, our particular region, or our country. This is what political scientists would call a prisoner's dilemma. It's a classic game theoretic problem where, where the instinct to act to preserve one's individual interests actually undercuts the collective good. And so everybody ends up being worse off in, in the long run. So let's talk about this challenge in the context of the COVID pandemic and what the COVID pandemic might tell us for, for about the future. Uh, this is truly an unprecedented situation. I think the COVID pandemic has, has been a visceral global level lesson to to billions of people around the world in a couple of key things. First, the, the, the fact that we share our fate on this planet. And I'm going to emphasize this point a lot, I'll come back to it. Uh, and and, and uh, also in the reality of the impacts of nonlinear behavior in complex systems. So that means the capacity of systems to shift 
from one state to another very fast. So between mid-March and mid-April of 2020, something extraordinary happened, unprecedented in the history of the species. Almost half the behavior of the, uh, half the species changed its behavior overnight. Almost 4 billion people on the planet went into lockdown. And the concept of social distancing, if somebody had asked me back in January last year what social distancing meant, I would have shrugged and said no. But that concept of social dis distancing went around the planet and billions of people understood it within a matter of, of weeks and started changing their behavior in response to, to the recommendations from public health authorities. This was an unprecedented unprecedented uh, civilizational response, something we've never seen before in, in the history of the species, as I said. As I said. So I think it was Carol Off who, who mentioned, you know, is the pandemic kind of a precursor of, of an increasingly severe and more frequent shocks we're going to see in the future because of this larger poly crisis, although she didn't use that terminology. And I would say, yes, that's the case. This is a foretaste, a forerunner of what we're going to see. And, and to the extent that we can prepare and adapt to this kind of challenge now, we're going to be better off in the future to cope with the worst crises coming down the pike. So this, this situation that we face on the planet is unprecedented actually three ways. If you look at it, it's sort of the historical trajectory of human, humanity. Uh, uh, first of all, the humankind is all linked together and connected, hyper-connected in a way that we never have been before, which is one of the things that allowed the information about the coronavirus and the importance of changing to the sort of behavior, the, the lockdowns, to the information about lockdowns and, to spread around the planet almost instantaneously. We have extraordinary scientific knowledge about the problems we we face, whether it's COVID, the structure of the virus in particular, how it's mutating, or on climate change, the exact, the exact nature of, of, of the causes of our problem in terms of the changing constituents of the atmosphere, and also what the consequences of, of climate change might be. We have vastly more knowledge now than, say, folks did in Europe, people did in Europe during the Black Death, when they didn't really understand the problem and how, how to respond. So that's an enormous advantage. And then we have this reminder again that we are all living on this planet together. So with respect to climate change, I often get asked by people who don't think about the problem that much but are starting to realize, and realize that maybe it's pretty serious. They, they, they ask, where can I go? Where can I go? Where can I take my family to keep them safe when things start to fall apart, when things get bad? And my answer is nowhere. There's nowhere on the planet you can go, just like you can't go anywhere on the planet really to escape COVID. Uh, uh, and and it, even those places, zones where the COVID isn't, isn't, uh, isn't prevalent right at the moment are constantly going to have to protect themselves and will always be faced if the disease is endemic outside their borders with the possibility of it intruding into their societies. Just like that, there's nowhere you can go on the planet to escape from climate change. It's intrusive everywhere because we've changed the energy balance of the entire atmosphere and raise the, raise the amount of radiation or heat radiation that's trapped within the ocean atmospheric surfaces, surface around the entire planet. There's nowhere we can go to escape. Uh, and, and, and Paul Martin mentioned the same kind of idea when he said, you know, ultimately we have to vaccinate everybody on the planet because if we leave some pockets unvaccinated, there will be the opportunities for variants and mutations to develop which will come and spread to the rest to the rest of the rest of the planet. I think one of the things that's going to emerge from the COVID pandemic is, is a new model of global public health. And it's going to resemble something like uh, uh, the immune system that operates within the human body or within the mammalian body. We are going to, in, because these variants are going to continue to develop, we will, never all, we will never entirely eliminate this coronavirus and it's going to continue to mutate. We will have to set up an, a global system of genomic sequencing to track how the variants are developing and respond in real time with new kinds of vaccines that are adopted or adapted to, to uh, the new variants that are developing. That's, they'll be in a complex system terms, it'll look very similar to the kind of immune system with its macrophages and antibodies and white blood cells and T cells that we have circulating within our bodies to protect us from, from, 
from uh, uh, pathogens of various kinds. We're gonna have to develop the same sort of thing at the global level, which could be a precursor for all kinds of global cooperation to deal with a range of other problems we're facing, such as climate change. I think that we fundamentally face as a species and within our individual societies like Canada, but globally as a species, a choice between two pathways into the future, a pathway of uh, solidarity and a pathway of division. It's a point that I've been making repeatedly over the last months. Under the pathway of division, to refer to what, again, what uh, Dr. Daniel Martin, Daniel Martin was saying, uh, the dominant motivation, the dominant motivation and emotion will be fear fear and outrage. In fact, this century is going to be a century that is awash in fear as these pressures build, uh, such as climate change, because they are in many ways inescapable. Even if we do the most we can to reduce climate change in the future, there is still going to be tremendous disruption and that will scare people. And that fear leads to dehumanization. It leads to, it leads to divisions between groups Instead of thinking of ourselves as a collective we, we start to think of ourselves as we and they and try to build those barriers Carol Off was referring to. What we're seeing along this pathway to the extent that we can see it going forward is a really pernicious interaction between the pressures of this poly crisis I've talked about and our emotional responses of fear and outrage and dehumanization. And something that hasn't been mentioned today, the technological environment of social media that have created bubbles, kind of separate communities of people who have their own worlds that they live within. I call this a problem of epistemic fragmentation, of the pulling apart of the shared understandings and sh shared conception of our, of our reality that we have to have if we're going to engage in the collective action to solve our problems. So that's the pathway of division that I think is very much a possibility going forward that could lead to what I call in my book, the Mad Max future. But there's also this possibility of a pathway of solidarity where we see and recognize our shared fate, where, we, we, where the dominant emotions are emotions of empathy. Uh, and empathy is combined with the recognition that ultimately our self-interest is, is going to be served by working together too. That we're either going to survive together and prosper on this planet, or we're all going to die together. And I think that is becoming increasingly clear to people around the world that you can't run away. And even to the extent that you try to gate yourself off and shield yourself from outside forces and outside groups, that ultimately you will only be able to preserve at best yourselves a little bit longer than everybody else. And that's not the future that any of us want for our children. So we need to leverage our scientific knowledge and the connectivity I talked about a few minutes ago. And we need to really fundamentally address this problem of epistemic fragmentation that is accentuated by social media, the echo chambers and the bubbles that allow things like QAnon to take root and strike at the heart of, of our democracies. So in my last couple of minutes, I'm just going to talk about where Canada can fit in this future. I, I think given the unprecedented nature of our situation, the recognition of shared faith, the hyperconnectivity, the scientific knowledge that we have about our situation, that we are on the potential, we are on the cusp potentially of a shift to a, a, a radically new set of worldviews and understandings about who we are and what our role is as a species on this planet. The great German existential philosopher Karl Jaspers in the mid 20th century uh, identified a period of time between 600 BCE and 200 BCE that he called the Axial Age. This is a period when five great human civilizations that weren't actually communicating very much, very much with each other in those days, uh, all shifted their cosmologies simultaneously, changed their moral frameworks and their understanding of the realities in which they were living. And the result laid the foundation for modernity. For, for the conceptual apparatus, the political systems and the social systems of modernity. I think we're on the cusp of, of a very similar shift this century. Everything's on the line. We're in an extraordinarily crisis, an extraordinary crisis, but there is this possibility for, for flipping uh, in a nonlinear way to a new kind of understand, sets of understandings and the institutions and technologies that would, that would uh, 
coalesce with those understandings, complement those understandings to produce a better world in the future. We in the Cascade Institute here on Vancouver Island are focusing in particular on, on the, the possibilities of worldview shifts, of value changes and normative changes in people's minds so that they can see things in new ways to lay the ground for that kind of collective action that Paul Martin was talking about. The, 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 the uh, COVID pandemic has really raised fundamental questions about the role of government, shared fate, as I've been talking about it, how broad our sense of we-ness is, whether it's our, just our community, our country, or the globe, relations between humans and nature has raised fundamental questions about our responsibility to others, and especially our responsibilities to future generations. What's Canada's role in this? In a recent conversation with Heather Reisman, uh, Heather remarked to me that, that uh, she felt that Canada has a special voice when it comes to these new kinds of value systems in the world, value systems that will help us sustain hope. Canada, in many respects, shouldn't exist as a nation when you look at us geographically and economically. Uh, it, it, we are, we are a, a, an extraordinary artifice, but we've managed to keep ourselves together with good governance and with com democratic conversations among ourselves that have, that have for the most part, uh, uh, been grounded in tolerance and respect and, and uh, the, the, uh, an understanding that we'll do better if we focus on the common good. These are principles that are at the core of the Canadian Federation and Canadian culture and society, the core of, for instance, the Kuchichin conferences that are, that are important, not just to our own survival as a society, but to the survival of our species. And these are ideas that we can cultivate and take to the larger world. So thank you very much and uh, love to have a further conversation with Wendy and folks online. Wow, that was terrific. Um, and that's a, a free form discussion. <laughs> <laughs> you should see my piece of paper <laughs> here. I'll show you. There it is. <laughs> you know, it was very funny when you when you came to uh, Kuchiching in 2008, what I recall is when you heard that there is a no PowerPoint rule, I think you did some graphs like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, actually, I think people are zoomed out and they're tired of slides and having their screens taken over by people. So being able to just talk is better sometimes. Um, so you, you pretty much uh, laid out, you know, your, some of your work from your previous books and how you got to writing um, Commanding Hope. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about the reaction you've had to the book? Um, this is not a year like any others. Normally, I'm sure you'd be doing book tours and launches and speaking uh, around the country and around the world. And of course, it's an entirely different way. But what sort of reactions are you having to your book right now? Uh, well, professionally, uh, in sort of the cognoscente of, uh, of, of reviewers, uh, certainly the most positive reactions I've ever had to any, anything I've written. So the reviews have been terrific. And, and what I've really, um, uh, really um, been pleased to see with the reviews and something I wasn't expecting. And on all the conversations I've had with people in book conferences and things, because it's all been done on Zoom, as you were suggesting now, uh, book fairs, is that everybody reads the book in a different way. They take their own passage through the stories. As you know, it's quite a complicated book. It has a number of different threads to it. And people, it, different parts resonate with them in powerful ways. And I found that really heartening to see. Um, uh, I, I actually had finished finished it. I started working on it in 2012, and I finished it in early 2020. And uh, it went off to Knopf, the publisher, and uh, we got it into uh, uh, into page proofs, which means it looks like a book, right? You have a PDF, and it looks like a book, and uh, it's really exciting. And then, of course, the pandemic started, and and we were all tearing our hair out because the book seemed to speak directly to the issues of the pandemic but it didn't mention the pandemic, of course. So uh, I had a, emergency calls with the, my publisher and editors and, and folks, and, and I had to go back and uh, go through every single sentence in the book and substantially change, change it to connect it to the lived experience people were going to be having when they read the book, because we knew the pandemic was going to continue for a long time. Uh, I think it speaks to the moment, um, you know, uh, there, there are a lot of parts of the argument, but one that I will just emphasize because I think it's relevant to this conversation is my commitment to what I call honest hope. So 
the notion of commanding hope I develop has three components, honest hope, astute hope, and powerful hope. But the foundation of it all is honest hope, which means that our hope has to be grounded in a very realistic understanding of the seriousness of the situation we face. And, and uh, there's kind of an emotional trajectory in the book. It, it starts out by talking a lot about hope and everybody gets, oh, okay, then we can make this work. And then I say, I, I have a middle part of the book where I talk about how serious the situation is. And it goes, you know, oh yeah, this is looking bad. Where's the hope here? And then towards the end, I say, okay, given this serious situation, this is how we can still preserve some role for hope and some place for hope along the lines that I, I, I outlined in my talk a moment ago. Um, but the, the starting point has to be that honesty. It, 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 we have been deluding ourselves about how serious climate change is. It's far more serious than most people recognize. It, we've been deluding ourselves about the, the, the dangers that economic inequality and the economic shifts in our world present to us. We've been deluding ourselves about the dangers of demographic shifts around the planet. And, and, uh, and it's time to stop that because the longer we delude ourselves, the worse the situation is going to get. And at some point we won't be able to solve these problems at all. In your book, you, you, of course, you lay the scenes out. You talk about how dire it is, but you use in, in this book, um, I think as you did in the others too, two people to personify um, a, a difficult battle, a difficult challenge and getting a message through. And I think you talk quite a lot about um, uh, Stephanie May, who yes. is Elizabeth May's mother and a huge success in the, um, uh, uh, in the campaign to stop nuclear, above ground nuclear testing. And then you also talk about um, uh, the hero at everybody's dinner table, uh, Greta Thunberg. Can yes. you talk a little bit about how you have, have uh, observed their paths and their successes and also what you think we're going to be seeing from Greta who, who tore a strip off uh, the people at Davos yet again this week? Uh, so Greta Thunberg is a remarkable woman. Uh, I guess you would say young woman. I mean, she was a child when she started this by any reasonable definition. And, uh, and I, I think um, I, I use, I, I don't know Greta Thunberg. I don't have any, you know, any, any more documentation about how she thinks and how she sees the world than the rest of us do by looking at, at her speeches online, which I've read very carefully. And, they, and, and she has a remarkable capacity to crystallize the moral challenge and the moral outrage that children should face right now. That parents were supposed to take care of their kids. And we failed fundamentally in that. And, and I have to say, you know, you talk about the, the, the folks who are at the stories of people who are at the core of my book. You didn't mention my two children, Ben and Kate, <laughs> who, who uh, are now uh, 12 and 15 and basically grew up and emerged into this world as I was writing this book. And I realized I had, had to write the book about hope because I was, because the thing that gave me the most anguish was the possibility that Ben and Kate would lose hope as they as they grew up into this turbulent world and potentially violent world. So the book is dedicated to them. But Stephanie May and Greta Thunberg, I, th I think Greta is, is a modern, in a sense, incarnation of Stephanie May. And I, I happen to, in part through Elizabeth May and her brother, Jeffrey, I happen to have access to Stephanie May's uh, um, records, her memoirs and extraordinary scrapbooks from the period when she built a national movement in the United States and ultimately took it globally to mobilize mothers against testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. This was in the mid to late 1950s. And, uh, and I, I, was able to, I was able to examine how, she, how her psychology worked and how hope played a role in her own psychology. And, my, and that's where I distilled these three notions of honest, astute and powerful hope. And I think that Greta's approach, she's a hopeful person, but and she's angry, but she's still hopeful. And Greta's approach reflects ultimately all three of those elements too. I think that hope, there's, there are the folks out there right now who are arguing, we don't need hope. It's jettison hope. It's, it leads to wishful thinking. It leads to soft headedness. It leads to passivity. I think that's, those, those people are profoundly wrong human beings can't persevere in difficult times without hope. It just needs to be the right kind of hope. And that's what I argue for in the book. Um, I know we've got, we're going to uh, um, go to audience questions in a couple of minutes. I hope people will start sending it off to my uh, uh, dear colleague, uh, Doug West, who's, who's looking at them through the question and answer section of our site. Um, but I want to ask you one more question um, about some of the tools 
um, that you have developed to help break some of these impasses. And I think this is too where the book uh, is very different from your previous books, where you know you finally sort of sit, lay it out. Okay, here's what we would recommend, and go into some detail about um, the state space model, which looks like a Rubik's cube uh, <laughs> of, right. uh, of modeling, um, binding questions, which really are great to sort of take it into a different level, the discussion, and cognitive mapping. And I know people can, you if you'd like to go into it briefly, that's great, but I'd really like to know too, are people picking up these tools? Yeah, they are. I mean, I was just talking to some high school students last week here on the island who uh, just bought, with their teachers just spontaneously took these models and started to use them to uh, to map the different points of view of the people in the Capitol attack in Washington on January yeah. 6th. Uh, <laughs> I thought, whoa, that's interesting. I'd like to be a fly on the wall for that. So, so just for folks to put this all in perspective, you, you know, Wendy, you're quite right. My previous two books, The Ingenuity Gap and The Upside of Down were largely done diagnostic. They were, you know, what's the nature of the crisis we're facing as a species? Uh, why is it serious? And, and this book was always intended to be much more prescriptive. And one reason it took me 12 years to write it, or eight years to write, is because, it's because uh, the prescriptions are way harder than diagnosis <laughs> in this situation anyway, uh, because these are fundamentally wicked problems of the kinds we've been discussing today. So, uh, so Part of the prescription is is that is these three components. The middle component, astute hope, is about having the right kind of knowledge. It's a hope that's grounded in the right kind of knowledge, and especially knowledge of the of what's going on in the heads of other people outside you in terms of their understandings of the issues and the worlds around them. But not just that, but also self-understanding because most of us actually don't have a very good understanding of why we hold particular points of view and attitudes towards things. And I go through a bunch of thought experiments when I even unpack my own points of view and show, gee, I didn't recognize that above myself, uh, which is rather disturbing. So, so the tools, the cognitive effective mapping and the state space modeling and the binding questions are, I, I explain them in ways that anybody can use them. They're designed, they're intended for people to, to, to try to understand what it is that's going on in the heads of those people on Capitol Hill, or what's going on in the heads of people who support QAnon, or what's happened going, going on in the head of the grumpy uncle you have over for, you know, Christmas dinner or something like that, who, you know, and everything always blows up and everybody gets angry. And our initial reaction to that kind of thing is to think that the person on the other side, our, our, our interlocutor, is either deceitful or stupid. They're stupid because they just don't understand, or if they do understand, then they're just lying to us. And, and that's usually not the case. It doesn't get us very far in any further conversation. And too much now in our world, in our social media bubbles, we've all retreated into these places where we're yelling at each other. Now, I'm not of a, of a mind, I've studied conflict for too long to believe that, that if you just get everybody talking to each other and understanding each other's points of view, then everybody will sing Kumbaya and come together and it'll all be okay. That, that's just, that's nonsense. In fact, there is a body of work in this in conflict theory that suggests sometimes the more people understand each other, the more they actually don't like them, right? So uh, you know, you could go go and have a conversation about that one. So so, but what I do think, and this is where Stephanie, to take it back to Stephanie and Greta, when you understand your how your opponents see the world better, maybe there's some possibility to peel off some of them, to talk to them, construct some of them constructively and bring them on side or, or perhaps uh, change their points of view a little bit. But the most important thing is you're gonna be strategically smarter. You're gonna, you're gonna have more ability and power in the political struggle, for instance, against the structural vested interests that are trying to stop action on climate change. You're gonna be a lot better at it if you understand how these folks are coming to the game and how they see the world. And I found with these tools, and this is a personal, personal result, is I just don't get angry anymore. I say, oh yeah, I know where you're coming from. I understand how this works. So, so I can be much more, much more level-headed and constructive in my, in my strategic response. I realize that you think that I think that you think this is the essence of strategy, right? Human beings are really good at this. We're constantly looking into other people's minds, thinking about what other people are thinking about us. We usually get, we often get that wrong. To the extent that we can get it right, we're gonna be way more effective as activists and dealing with climate change, or activists dealing with racial injustice uh, uh, and to achieve the things that will make this a more positive world. And that's all part of what I call astute hope. Do we have enough time? 
do we have enough time? Well, that's a big question, right? Um, so I read a lot of climate science and it's really bad. The problem is with the climate system is that we're packing a lot of energy. I talked about this in my presentation. The amount of the imbalance in, the, in just very quickly, it sounds technical, but it'll be very fast. The, it, the imbalance in the amount of radiation coming in from space and going out to space as heat. Uh, because we've changed the radiative characteristics of the atmosphere, uh, there's more heat, more energy coming in than going out. So the planet is heating up. We know that. Most people don't realize what the implications are. It's about 0 0.8 watts per square meter across the entire surface of the planet. Doesn't sound like much. But when you add it up on a daily basis, it amounts to four to 500,000 Hiroshima bombs of energy every day that we're packing into the ocean atmospheric system. Most of that energy is going into the oceans and it's going to melt ice. It's going to melt ice in Antarctica and Greenland and the great glaciers across the, the mountain systems of the world. Eventually that lag will be gone. And this climate change problem is gonna hit us like a tidal wave. And folks don't realize, they, they think, oh, it's not really affecting me very much. It's a problem for the future. But once we get to that future, and by the way, now the future that the scientists envisioned in 1980 and 90 on climate change science, that future is starting to arrive now. And once we get to this future, it's too late, right? So the lags are working against us. There are a lot of non-linearities in the system, possibilities for current flips and ocean flips, changes that once they happen like dying coral reefs, you know, they will be gone, they'll erode and they'll disappear. So uh, I think there is now the sense in public policy circles, people who understand the science, that we gotta move really fast. Uh, be because we're, we're in the, we're, we're in, you know, I call it, it's like use a football metaphor, we're deep in our own end zone and we have one pass left and we're down six points. And, uh, and we've got to do the Hail Mary pass at this point. And, it's got an, and we've got to nail our receiver for those, of, those folks who understand football metaphors. And, and uh, yeah, so uh, is it too late? I think there's reason, good reason for hope, but uh, we can't delay a moment longer. Tad, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to pass it to uh, Doug, um, who will ask a few of the questions that have popped up in the Q&A. And again, thank you, Tad. Hopefully, can't use that anymore. Uh, <laughs> sure you can. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of participants on this conversation, a lot of people who I hope will be looking at the uh, transcripts or the tape of this conversation and we'll get some great ideas. So thank you again. Well, and I, I want to congratulate you all for doing this. This is such a terrific contribution to, to the discourse in Canada. So thank you so much for from all of the participants today. Doug, you're I muted. muted myself. Yeah, there you are. Not anymore. There you are. Okay. So um, there are a number of questions that came in and I I've picked three, so um, I will start with the first one. And this is from, and I'm gonna try and pronounce this name uh, because I think one of the things we need to learn how to do is pronounce names in indigenous yes. languages. Kanekwanta Ken Tatinationi asks, have you been exposed to the Gainalegua Great law of peace. And do you have any ideas on how to make these principles and protocols accessible to all residents of any watershed treaty territory? So I'm really, really glad that question was asked in part because I dropped a thread at the beginning, which I didn't pick up at the end of my presentation. Uh, I, I talked about the importance of indigenous perspectives. Um, so the short answer to this specific question is no, I have not been exposed to it, and, but I am as open as, as, any, as I could possibly be to, to these conversations and to this knowledge. Um, I, I mentioned very, just in passing at the end of my presentation that COVID has opened up space for normative change, for change in people's worldviews. And I talked about a bunch of things, so change in our attitudes towards role of government, uh, towards the, uh, respons our responsibility to others, especially to children, and also a change in attitude regarding our relationship to nature. 
And uh, I have a quotation at the end of my end of my book uh, from a, an, an indigenous elder in the United States who says, you know, things look a lot different when you think of the natural world around us, not as resources, but as relatives, that living things around us that we treat as resources, the forest, the sea, it's the fish in the sea, et cetera, not as resources, but as relatives. That's a, that immediately flips our mind to realize our profound connectedness with our natural environment. And, uh, I, and I think that many indigenous perspectives have had that at the center of their worldviews for millennia. And a part of what we need to do this century in this second axial age is, is understand as best we can, uh, those of us who are not indigenous, um, how those ideas work. And and uh, and and perhaps as much as best we can adopt uh, components of those ideas into a new worldview that will help us live on this planet better. The the sense that human beings are exceptional, that we are separate from nature, that nature is ours to exploit, that we dominate nature. The all of these ideas, which might have been serviceable some some decades ago, are no longer serviceable, and they're getting us into terrible trouble. So, uh, so uh, the short answer is I'm not familiar with this particular perspective. I would like to me. I'd encourage, uh, I would encourage the questioner to write to me directly. I would like to start that conversation. But overall, these perspectives are enormously important, and we have much to learn. Those of us who are not indigenous. Thank you for that. Um, the second question comes from Ken Fike from Victoria. So I imagine you can help him. I can wave. <laughs> I am a senior and I want to make a difference. I already bought an e-car, but what more can I do? Well, we're blessed out here in BC because it's a relatively benign climate. And, uh, you know, since, since we've moved to BC, we've been able to cut our carbon, carbon output by, uh, I hope, eventually close to 90%. We have an e-car. There are all kinds of issues with electric vehicles. Um, ideally, even one should just uh, use public transit. Public transit should be electric. There are all these changes that you can make in your personal lives in terms of what you buy, what you eat, how you travel, how you heat your house, heating house, household heating, insulation. Those are such important. There's kind of everyday mundane technical matters, but they turn out to be really important. So there's lots of stuff we can do individually. And it actually makes a really big difference for those of us who have the financial capacity and lots of people don't. And there the government has to step in to provide the subsidies to make it possible. But for those of us who have the financial capacity, I think there is something of a moral commitment or a moral obligation to start that process in our individual lives. But there's this broader public sphere that we need to always be engaging in. There is so much we can do. Uh, and, and one of the things I love about, about Victoria, the local newspaper Times Colonist has just ongoing, very vigorous and informed conversation in the letters to the editor page about all of these issues we've been discussing today. Um, uh, there's, there's a greater awareness out here on the West Coast, as everybody realizes, of environmental problems, greater sensitivity, more of environmental culture, greater sensitivity to the changes, the smoke that we've been faced with for the last number of years in the summer, the threats of forest fires have really scared people. And, and so there are things we can do in these public conversations. They can be just at a dinner table. They can be in, in, during elections. They can be in the letters to the editor page or online and blog posts and the like. Uh, they can be through our pension funds, big issue for seniors, but not just for seniors, but for all of us, because we're all invested in the Canadian pension plan. And the CPPIB, the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board, does not have, I think, a set of investment investment criteria that reflects the urgency of the challenge we face. 30, 40 trillion dollars of potential money, uh, pension money on campus that on on the on globally, not on campus, sorry, on globally that that could be shifted towards investment in green energy technology. And right at the moment, it's largely sitting on the fence. So these are things that we can all do in our own way. People might think, well, you know, it's just a little bit. How's it going to make any difference? But that's what Stephanie May found out. She started by just working at her kitchen table. And before, and, and three years later, she was speaking in front of 100,000 people in London at Trafalgar Square. It, 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 these things can snowball, especially with the connectivity we have very fast. It all starts with individual effort. Thank you. So one more question, and then I will 
let Wendy say goodbye to her friend. How's that? Um, so this is from Claire Brewster. And this actually brings us back to the beginning in some ways. After listening to discussions on health and environment, if we circle back to the Honorable Paul Martin's comments about the false distinction between economic and social policy, and also the international oversight of productive finance, how can we create triple bottom line drivers to address social determinants of health, justice, and sustainability? There you go. Yeah. A uh, wonderful question. So, uh, you know, there are there's a lot of conversation going on in financial markets and in business circles about what corporate financial responsibility is and how and what the criteria are for uh, for making judgments about investments and uh, and and also risks. So, when corporations are reporting uh, their climate risks, what criteria are they using? when pension funds are doing the same, what criteria are they using? And it's an alphabet soup of ideas out there right now. And I can't, you know, frankly, I, you know, it's all there sort of somewhere in my head, but I, I'm not going to sort of run through the, the different, the different specifics, but um, the bottom line, what I'm reading from ex people who are experts on, on, on these conversations is that there's, there's a huge amount of diversity that there isn't a lot of coalescence around common frameworks, or maybe we're just beginning to see it. And that, and, and the fragmentation of these criteria allows a, a lot of greenwashing to take place because people can sort of adopt principles uh, that, that allow them to look like they're doing a good job, but aren't. So, so this is a standards problem. Uh, and what we found in the world is that when you get the standards settled, for protecting, and in this case, it's not just protecting environmental factors or environmental values, but social values, uh, dealing with uh, problems of injustice and inequality in our society. So there are a lot of things that need to be reflected. And you, when, you, when you get the standards right for, for instance, measuring risk relating to those values, uh, uh, then, then, and if you actually have good metrics, so, so companies can report exactly where they sit on these metrics, then you find that, that uh, the, the private markets and private sector will start to innovate within that framework very fast. And you can get a surge in productive innovation. Right at the moment, uh, it's, it's, it's not, it hasn't coalesced, in part because we're still having this broader conversation within, the, within Canada and even around the world about what these values are. At the end of my book, I try to actually say in some detail what I think the core values of an alternative, more positive worldview might be in the future. But ultimately those need to be reduced into very practical things like standards, standards for, for manufacturing steel, standards for financial risk in marketplaces for pension funds. And, and, and uh, that's a hard job, but settling those standards will make the difference in whether we can turn our markets and the forces, the incredible innovative forces of markets in the right direction. Okay, thank you very much for your TAD talk. Uh, I'm gonna <laughs> no, send like it that. back to Wendy. And <laughs> I know- well, I, You were I'm waiting all day to say that, weren't you? <laughs> it, yeah. um, Wendy to say goodbye, but also Wendy, if you could introduce our next segment, which is a uh, John and, uh, and Madeline making a statement to the crowd. How's that? Sure. Uh, Tad, thank you so much for this talk this afternoon. And also, uh, uh, listeners may not know that you've been uh, listening in all through the day, even though we haven't seen your lovely face all, until this last hour. And we appreciate your ability to have uh, woven in a lot of the themes and discussions that we've heard early on the day in the true traditional uh, Kuchichik manner of building on each other's con uh, conversations and contributions. I remember fondly talking to people in a lineup for lunch and hearing them say to a, a keynote speaker, and yet another thing. So I think you've been able to um, um, uh, imitate that wonderful style of building on each other's expertise and information and, and great comments. So thank you, Tad, for that. Um, Good. As we, Thanks uh, so much. Go, as we go into our, our next segment, um, again, the Kuchiching tradition is that we're a little bit late, not, not that late, just a little bit late with uh, our sessions because people have a lot to say. So we appreciate that. Uh, our next uh, session will be 
a very brief one with Madeline Koch and John Curtin with a few closing remarks about this Kuchiching Conference um, 2021. And also um, just wanted to make sure that people are ready for the um, optional open chat and network session. I'm, I've been asked to remind people that there will be a pause of a couple of minutes. They will get a link to the other room. Um, and then we hope that you will have a chance to reconnect with, with people that you've been seeing online. So over to you, uh, Madeline and John. Hi there. It's me. Um, <laughs> this has been uh, terrific and we are uh, so delighted to see such a great range of participants from so many places um, within Canada and beyond and with such varied experiences, you know, there've been among you professors and home care workers and civil students and students and civil servants, I should say, and civil students, <laughs> and old friends of Kuchiching and new friends. And we are really grateful to the Canadian International Council, which um, thanks to Ben Roswell and Daniel List have become the custodian uh, or has become the custodian of the Kuchiching Conference. Um, we're also very grateful to, our, uh, to each of our speakers, our old friends, Paul Martin and Daniel Martin and Tad Homer Dixon and Bill Graham, and our new friends, Annemi Paul and Josh Jarterson. And of course, to our excellent moderators, our CBC friends, Carol Off, who actually spoke at Kuchiching a few years ago, and Adrian Hirewood, welcome to, to the fold, and our very own Wendy Felton. And uh, thanks also to my uh, fellow committee members. There's quite a few of you, but I want to single out Doug in particular, who, um, who had to work quite hard today to pick among the huge number of really good questions that you all had. It's quite heartwarming to see the Cooch tradition continue. And I think my father, Eric Koch, would be um, delighted along with our good friend, Alan Pearson. Um, they'd both be very pleased to see this reincarnation. Um, I'm not sure we'll uh, ever be able to uh, gather again on the shores of Lake Kuchiching, but we can keep sprinkling the fairy dust, the Kuchiching fairy dust to provide opportunities like this for people to come together to discuss the challenges and the issues that we're all facing and struggling with. And so we can come away better equipped to make the world a better place as Kuchiching has been able to do since 1932. So I'm going to raise my mug and turn it over to John. Thanks. And uh, I will show my Kuchiching uh, sweatshirt um, as evidence for what I'm about to say. As someone who has attended every one of the old Kuchiching conferences since uh, 1985, I want to thank all our viewers uh, from the Kuchiching family, uh, from the CIC, and beyond uh, for coming together uh, today to make this our first full-scale new Kuchiching conference an even bigger success uh, in many ways uh, than we've ever had uh, before. Now to build on today's momentum, please email us your ideas uh, beyond the wonderful ones on the uh, chat and Q&A about what topics, what speakers, uh, you'd like to see for our next events in the coming months, uh, we hope. And please offer to help us uh, organize them. Uh, anyone can get involved in Cooch that way. So uh, email them uh, to us, uh, the email koochaching at the cic.org. And finally, uh, I'd like to encourage everyone to join the CIC, where I first became a loyal member in 1970 and have been one uh, ever since. And do feel free to donate financially uh, to the Kuchiching component of the CIC through the CIC uh, website so we can keep today's uh, Kuchiching spirit alive and uh, indeed uh, make it uh, thrive at our forthcoming events. So we hope to see you uh, all again very soon. May I just say one more thing because I forgot that we are indeed planning future events. Um, and uh, I 
uh, if all goes according to plan, the next one will probably be um, hosted or organized by our friends out west in uh, Vancouver. So stay tuned. Thank you, Madeline and John. It's been my pleasure to work with all of you. And I look forward to much more of this in the future. I think we, we, we did it. It worked. <laughs> so, um, I now invite everybody to wait about five, ten minutes to get placed into one of the breakout rooms. I've asked Dan, Daniel to make five breakout rooms that I think the panelists and Madeline and John and all of us can, in, can visit. But this is the spirit of coming to the lake and meeting after the speeches. And we don't have any champagne, but, you know, we'll pretend. So thank you, everybody. I thank everybody, and I'll see you in the rooms. Uh, sorry, just to clarify, the oh. uh, you will need to click on a link to join one of the breakout rooms. You'll need to click on a link that I've sent in the chat, uh, and we'll see you there in five minutes. You will be put in a holding room for a few minutes as we transition this set of NDs over to a different link. And I must say in front of everyone, Daniel, you have been amazing in keeping us all going forward as opposed to sideways. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Asking, do we as panelists transition ourselves or do we just move automatically? Sorry, Josh. <laughs> I'll just click on the